take the light yeah. down a bit. So. microphone on okay we're ready to go uh, good afternoon welcome everyone to this first panel discussion on the art of display that is the role and meaning of exhibition and display architecture my name is Wouter Davids and I'm your host of this first discussion and in that capacity it's my pleasure and honor to introduce you my these two distinguished people here on my left <laughs> that are the two curators of the exhibition art on display 1949 to 1969. So allow me to shortly introduce them. Second on my left is Penelope Curtis, the director of the Kaluste Gulbenkian Museum. And apart from being a curator and director at such arts institutions at State Britain in London and the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds, Penelope is also an avid scholar. She has a long-standing interest in the interrelationship between art and architecture from the interwar period up to the present with a particular interest in the place of sculpture that is in the modes and means of the display of the object that sculpture is in particular. And on this specific topic, she published in 2015 the exquisite book, I all advise you to read, Patio and Pavilion, a research that no doubt informed the exhibition that we will discuss this afternoon. On my left here is Dirk van den Heuvel, is associate professor at the Department of Architecture in the Technical University uh, of Delft. He's also co-founder and head of the Jaap Bakema Study Center at Nieuwe Instituut in Rotterdam. He's an expert in post-war modern uh, architecture and planning, on which he has published uh, extensively. Dirk, on the other hand, is not solely an academic, but also an active curator. He has co-curated co several exhibitions on the work of post-war architects, such as Team 10 and Alison and Peter Switzen, as well as a Dutch pavilion on the 14th International Architecture Exhibition at the Biennale di Venezia in 2014. So this afternoon we will discuss the exhibition they curated together and try and assess, that's my role, to make them speak about the aims and the challenges of making, conceiving and realizing uh, this exhibition, this joint endeavor. And as a what we'll do, I'll shortly explain the procedure, we'll start with some larger questions and topics at stake uh, I think, and I'll ask them to them in the exhibition, and then we'll move to very concrete examples. So I took the liberty to take some, so don't mind the photography, installation shots of the exhibition, so we can talk very specifically about certain moments, positions, and places in the exhibition that triggered my attention for several reasons. And so I'm not going to grill them, but uh, question them <laughs> about uh, what was for them at stake. And as you all know, but it's good to repeat, they took uh, the museography of the uh, Gulbenkian Museum as a starting point, celebrating the 50th anniversary of this institution. And to that end, they bring together five positions, you could say, of diverging solutions to the display of art in the two decades after the Second World War, from presenting work by Franco Albina and Franca Elk, the first two the first of which is very influential, and it's the essay that Penelope wrote in the catalog, who's not openly uh, acknowledged, but I think she makes a very fair and convincing point, a very influential figure for the design of the display of uh, this institution. And then they bring a series of other protagonists to the stage that developed in the same years and shortly after um, other and different ways of presenting art, ranging from Carlo Scarpa, who was a peer of Albini, and uh, other architects like Aldo van Eyck, Alison and Peter Smitsen, and Dino Bobardi. And I'd like to start with uh, something the curators state in the introduction, that it is their aim to investigate the way we look at art and the way art has been presented. So we'll zoom in on the role of display, display devices, not solely architecture, I think it's a pretty, architecture as such is probably Mm, not the most suitable term, but I'd like to start with one question that I partly drew also from your essay, Dirk, in the catalogue, that in the, inter uh, the decades after the post-war, exhibition architecture was for architects like a playground, a way to pursue ideas, but also to communicate ideas and test ideas. It was something where they could experiment with architecture in a way that was 
not say impossible, far more difficult in regular building practice. So, but if an exhibition and exhibition architecture, display architecture, is indeed a means and a vehicle to pursue and test ideas, if, as in your case, you make an exhibition on display architecture, to what extent is that very capacity of the exhibition also has taken your enterprise? So to what extent is this exhibition, apart from being an historical exhibition, also a means for you both to pursue ideas, to communicate ideas and to test ideas? No, you start. <laughs> <laughs> so it's wow, it's a very good question, yeah. Um, I like the idea of the playground, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, in the work mm -hmm. of Aldo van Eyck, it's very important, of course. Um, and yesterday, I recall you called it a laboratory, mm -hmm. which was, in fact, a new term. Well, well it's, it is, that term is in my essay. Ah, okay, yeah, so... <laughs> I had already absorbed it and then <laughs> moved on, sorry. <coughs> uh, but yeah, but it is, uh, we, and we discussed it uh, also as a, as a didactic exercise uh, in a way, as a research didactic exercise. So, um, but that makes it more um, scholarly and serious and the playground is uh, more explore, exploring mm -hmm. new possibilities. I think that they, uh, architects after the war were desperate to get going and it was easier and quicker to get going in exhibitions so mm -hmm. obviously you could do things in exhibitions that you couldn't do in real life um, it might take five or ten years to yeah. make a building whereas it can take a few months to make a show I think in a way it's ironic because these many of these shows were made very very quickly the Smithsons shows and the Van Eyck shows in Amsterdam and Liège were very very quick mm -hmm. And for us, it's taken us months and months and months to try and get it right. So it's almost you know, the opposite. We've been kind of painstaking yeah. in trying to get the information and trying to interpret the information to get it right. Um, a number of people asked me at the opening whether this was my uh, starting point to mm. change the museum. That's where it was aiming at, partly. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I suppose... I don't know, the answer to that is yes and no, because... Excuse me, can you do something about the microphones, please? What's happening? It's uh, yeah, the there's a very uh, high noise. Care of it, yeah. Yeah. A pitch is it because um, every now and then. It's probably because there's resonance with the loudspeakers. No, it's fine, but... Uh, ah, OK, maybe only we hear it. Oh, you hear it too, Francine hears it too. Must depend on your must depend on your level of louder? Your type of hearing. Well, we have to speak. So we have to speak louder, and then the ah, microphones can go down. The levels can go okay. Down. okay, we'll speak louder. Yeah. <laughs> okay, please. Um, I I don't know. In, in a way, that would mean to go backwards, to to mm. go back to the way the museum was. What we've done in the museum is lay out some of the original photographs and drawings, so you can see exactly how it was. People often think it hasn't changed, but it has changed in quite a large degree, and it was remodelled fairly extensively in the year 2000. There are quite a lot of new interventions. So it would be possible to go backwards. I don't think it would necessarily be very interesting, and that wasn't my intention, to do the archival research, to work out how to restore the museum to the way it was in 1969. I think I was more interested in trying to understand why people enjoy going around this museum so much and to try and identify some of those elements without uh, necessarily trying to pinpoint it. I just have noticed since I've been here that the visitors generally enjoy their experience. And if I ask them, can they say why? They can't really put their finger on what was enjoyable. So I think for me, this was an effort to try and unpack the different bits of viewing experience and to try and understand it a bit better. But I would say that now that we've made it, and I just I would like to mention Rita Albergria here because she was really instrumental in making the show. Um, now we can think about it. So for, it was I think it was a laboratory exercise in a way, so that I would like now to think 
I'll take my time to look at the show and see how it works, how it functions. Uh, I always think that curators are very guilty of, as soon as a show opens, leaving it behind and moving on to the next show. But I would like to see here whether people like to look at things one by one or in mass, in comfort or in discomfort, whether they... Just to see how people react to those different scenarios so that they were like kind of test mm -hmm. models. Because if you say how it works, then the way you describe it is uh, how people experience. While it seems that the show, and I think to a very successful uh, end, dives into history and digs up historical models that you explore and reinterpret, remake, represent. But by presenting works of your own collection, you surpass the historical. And so it's, so if you say it works, is it indeed on the level of experience or the visitors granting an historical awareness of what has happened? It seems that the historical, the documentary part is not less important, but at least not as present in the, in the endeavor. I think it's always hard to make exhibitions about architecture mm -hmm. and I, uh, too many of them end up being books that are laid out in space. Uh, so I, I did want it to be experiential and I didn't want it to be too archival. So although we both did quite a lot of archival research, mm -hmm. I think that's in, the, uh, in our essays um, and we managed to let it go in the exhibition. The exhibition uh, I think is much freer it's not embedded in the archive. Mm -hmm. And Dirk, you teach in an architecture school. Mm -hmm. So to what extent is it for you also a design project? Because you have the curatorial yeah. project, the historical project. But since many of the, and I think that's probably the next <coughs> slide. <coughs> oh, I'm not pointing right. Oh no, not this one. This one, yeah. So how much design has there been involved in a sense? Because some of the projects, like the show of Aldo van Eyck in Liège, was not well documented, no plans. Yeah. So there is, to use a bit of a simple term, quite a creative aspect to this exhibition yeah. as well. How did you balance that following your aim of not making a solely documentary architecture exhibition how did that balance, how did you strike that balance between design experience and historical awareness? Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how, where to start really. Um, or maybe concretely the, 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 the one element yeah. with the coals, which is for me really a highlight of the show. Yes, not I because see. it was yeah. shown in my country alone, but, yeah. but the fact yeah. I, why I not only know this through photographs Belgium. and so to encounter yes. it. To so encounter it, yes. Yeah, you were also <coughs> always fond of the yes. coals. I, I, I've, I've uh, liked, the, I've liked the idea of that ever since I first encountered yeah. it. But yeah. we just worked from <coughs> minimal photographic yeah. documentation. We had, we didn't yeah. have, so we had to work it. We just looked and thought, this must be, yeah. this must be. It's mm. an approximation it in that sense, and in that sense also a, a proper <coughs> reconstruction. It's reconstructed from the little uh, uh, historical evidence that was there. Uh, f uh, working with students, I, I also did mm -hmm. a seminar, a research seminar with uh, students. But they didn't uh, on give the us the answers we wanted. They struggled a lot, <laughs> and um, and reconstruction for them was uh, literally a redesign. They they rather would engage in redesigning than uh, first investigating uh, originals. Let's say or trying to get as close as possible. You have to speak Maybe I'm you. the source of all this uh, misery. <laughs> that soft Dutch accent. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? Oh my God. Uh, That's better, should, right? I should speak up. I should really, yeah, so not, not think while speaking. Um, well, the design of the show is, of course, uh, Rita's, uh, 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 she, she's a real designer of the exhibition. We are the curators uh, mm. of the, the exhibition. So it's, it's not, in that sense, it's not quite fair to put the question of design to me. but. I can say a few things about it in that how to, uh, one of the big questions, how to balance it, is that you deal with 
uh, uh, reconstructions, fragments from the past. And uh, one of Tess van Eyck's concern, I had endless conversations, still have conversations with Tess van Eyck on how to approach this, uh, this topic, how to reconstruct a legacy that is so heavy and important as uh, van Eyck. And she compared it with a, an act of uh, uh, biological dissection, as if we were taking apart a little flower in a biology class and then putting the flowers and the stems and the leaves next to one another. And she didn't like it, but basically, <coughs> and, and basically I agree with this, and, and I think it's very important to do this because I do believe that, uh, especially with the wall of Van Eyck that's here, this screen of concrete, mm. It shows just by focusing on one element, one aspect of this particular design, uh, that you recognize or uh, different qualities that you wouldn't recognize uh, if you would put the whole pavilion there as a unity, a unified object that is actually very hermetic, etc. Uh, and uh, and now uh, how it's put into space, um, slightly oblique, and we did already several tours and we had several conversations about it. Is this proper in terms of the geom geometry? Is the positioning like that not uh, alien to the geometry of Van Eyck, etc.? But <coughs> it becomes a big screen, the material quality becomes much uh, uh, clearer. Uh, the fact that it is a screen that frames the sculptures is, is becoming much more clear. Because so, in, in so, the catalog, so, you yeah. use the term quotation. <coughs> yeah. That, that you quote yeah. historical examples mm. in a pursuit to strengthen or calibrate your own understanding of the vocabulary of display uh, design. And so... I, I would say that in exhibition, <coughs> is not designed. Mm. Uh, um, because it, I, I think the, the, the big challenge was to understand what we were looking at um, and, to f and, to see, and to choose where to place the elements. So we spent a long time together, the three of us, thinking about which was the best way to dispose of the elements in space. Mm. Um, but, uh, and in fact, I would say that some of, some of them were relatively easy some were more complicated. The, the question of the pavilion, the Van Eyck mm. pavilion, was really challenging. But we fairly quickly arrived at the idea that Scarpa should be near daylight, that Albini could be an opening corner, mm. that the Van Eyck would be at least central, and we imagined, I think, always that the Bobardi would be at the end. So then it was a question of how they related to each other. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I think that, uh, for me, it's a virtue. That, that there isn't a a design, exactly. It's more that we have reconstructed mm. as well as we could the elements we selected to put in relation with each mm. other. Because I think it's a it's an really an interesting idea indeed that there is there is no design because an exhibition displaying display architecture or display design has something tautological. Your yeah. your dis in the very act of doing it, yeah. you're showing what you are, what is about showing. And mm -hmm. allow me to go back one slide. I think here with um, Van Eyck or the portion of the Van Eyck um, pavilion, the Sonsbeek pavilion, what I find striking is the pedestal. Yes. Obviously, it's a yeah, yeah. it's yeah. a practical solution. But yeah. there, I suddenly understood also what is at stake in the show is the exemplary nature of elements, or, but how did you deal in the, with the tautological nature of your endeavor? Because I think it turns, but I'd first like to hear, how did you meet that challenge? Well, just, just to come to the pedestal, start with the pedestal. Uh, this for me is perhaps the, it's the biggest shift. Hmm. Um, and, and, but we had to do it because we had to have a flat surface. Yeah and we didn't have a flat surface otherwise. But it really does alter the uh, experience because in originally and now in the Krola Muller Museum, you, could, you walk straight in. And now it's, the whole thing is more like a sculpture because you had to step onto the plinth. Mm -hmm. So that's changed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in, in, it's true that it's almost seamless in uh, the Krola Muller Park, but it also stands on this circular... It does. Concrete yeah, element, yeah. but it's not really a pedestal, but yeah. still. It's a floor. It's a floor. It's not yeah. a pedestal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the decision to 
put this one outside and have only one element inside. Um, what was the rationale behind basically pulling apart yes. something that was already well, partial? We, 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 in the very beginning, Rita certainly wanted to put it outside. Mm. And I think we were not convinced about that. We said it should be part of the show. Then we uh, discovered that the floor, the floor, the load-bearing capacity mm. of the floor was not high enough to support the whole structure. And also, it was a, a dirty construction and difficult to manage it in the time within the space where we were going to start installing art. So this was a real challenge. And <coughs> then we thought, OK, we have to put it outside. And we looked, first of all, at the garden side, but there the slope is really yeah. steep. Mm. Then we chose the, this site here. We, it took quite a long time to convince the board of the Gobenkian that this could happen. But meanwhile, we were thinking it would be nice at least to have part of it indoors. Mm. And I'm happy in the end with the solution we came to, which was forced upon us. But actually, I think having a fragment which allows you to think about the, as Dirk has been saying, the screen and the surface, the image more, and then here to think more about the experience of walking through, mm. you, you kind of pick apart the two mm. strong elements of the d original design. Mm -hmm. and yeah, you, yeah, please come. So more, well, uh, this is literally the tautological moment mm -hmm. where you're inside and then the, the view outside is framed by the Van Eyck screen. And it is very neatly uh, uh, orchestrated by Rita. So you get indeed this moment of, oh, the, uh, the, the screen inside is repeated outside. So I, I, I like that very much. It's maybe a bit um, too postmodern in the sense of quotations uh, one after another, but I think it's fair. And it's also fair to do it in terms of the light conditions, that the light conditions uh, of a pavilion that was designed for the outside, it's very hard to recreate that on the inside. Um, yeah, so, so in the, uh, yeah, um, but is it tautological? Uh, is it a problematic to be tautological? No, uh, no, 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 <laughs> I, no, but it's, it's, it's something you realize yeah. that you yeah. display, display. Yeah. So that's it. And yeah, then, that's... Uh, and, but yeah. I think that's a, <laughs> a fascinating challenge yeah. because it's self-reflexive. Yeah. And I think there's a moment that the self-reflexiveness <laughs> surmounts the tautology. And yeah, I now think for it me, happens for me, throughout it the helped, show. It helped me better understand the interior of the Gulbenkian Museum uh, and make it more explicit. So we also discussed uh, the, the non-design of the design, or is it... Mm. So Gus uh, even stated it's not an exhibition, so maybe we can talk about it later. So, so that there's an idea of uh, what, what, what is the project really aspiring to. But, but for me, it's, as you put it, it brings into sort of relationship these various positions. But having done that in this uh, beautiful and also enormous room of the museum, and then going back through the museum, I understood how incredibly picturesque mm. the whole routing of the museum is, even when it's in a rationalist box with two patios. Uh, the interior scenography is really like a, a very comfortable, generous sort of taking you from one place to another uh, as, as, as if a, a way of storytelling. And that then, yeah, so somehow I felt this approach in this room, what we did, s sort of fitting to that, that uh, quality. There's a, there's a kind of uh, informal route that you, you yeah. don't quite aware, you're not quite aware that you're following it, but so I think it is a bit like a, a house seems to me. But just to go back to the display of the display... Do you want to also go back to the image? Uh, it doesn't matter which image we use. But um, obviously we are displaying display. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, in a way, the problematic aspect is the art. Mm. Because uh, I've just noticed that um, since the show opened, the guards are giving all the visitors the list of the works of art, as if that was the key yes. to yes. the show. Yes. And for me, it's secondary. <laughs> Um, what I really want people to understand is the architects and the, yeah. the, the displays. And don't you think so that's I was thinking about this yeah. on my way to the conference today. So what are we doing to the art? 
Um, yeah, and we we had the uh, privilege and luxury here of being able to choose works from the collection, which were more or less appropriate, mm. but not foregrounding them uh, and not uh, worrying, over worrying about the works of art because we were focusing on the, the display. We were able, in a, some of the examples, to leave the display structure empty as a mm -hmm. kind of gesture to say it's about this as much as that. But I, I think the audience is still looking at the art more than the architecture. Do you think that's a problem? I think it means it's a kind of failure on our part. Yes. <laughs> ah, I would strongly disagree. Uh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's actually the merit of the exhibition. So, because if it would, I think the fact that you sort of forget of looking at only the devices that make it possible to see it. I think that moment of forgetting is also part of the success of the very things you're showing, is that they're very strong, very strong presences, all of them, but they, it's the kind of architecture that's very willful, but generous at the same time. And so that's why I picked up this yeah. image. I was lucky that a German lady performed exactly what I wanted. Oh, oh. no, sorry. Um, and she took a seat and started yeah. to look. Yeah. So she, I think she performed or did what that very setup is trying to achieve. And I didn't ask her what she was actually doing, <laughs> uh, whether she was looking at the, the, the display architecture or at yeah. the art. But I think the, the fact that you brought in the art of the collection itself creates this kind of I think productive confusion that it's not didactic. So for me, it was a big relief because many architecture yeah, yeah, yeah. exhibitions are, if not boring, didactic. Yeah. Because there's a demonstrative eagerness. Yeah. Here, I think it's very uh, delicate. So what I liked about this lineup, and I don't want to talk too long, but is the three, the three, um, not pedest well pedestals for painting, you could say. Leaving that one open, the reflexive viewer will understand and will suddenly realize, ah, someone's trying to tell me something here about how the things are presented at which I'm looking. But it's done in, um, uh, I think, a very refined way. So I wouldn't worry, actually. <laughs> um, oof, I'm really sorry. I would, I would quite like to have had the courage and support to have not have any labels, but all my colleagues told me that was impossible. Um, people had to know what the art was. But I would like people to relax about that in a way and not worry about what the, who the artist is, what mm. the title is, mm. because I think I would like them just to enjoy the experience and not, but I, I found people walking around the Bobardi, looking at the number, yeah. looking at the list, looking at the number, <laughs> looking at the list. Yeah, and I, that's a bit problematic for me. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess the extent to which you can control the behavior of the visitor sure, is sure. very, very little. <laughs> um, but you said a few moments earlier that you tried to understand what you were looking at. What did you understand by now? Like, what, what are... It's often when you make something, it takes a time to realize what it effectively is, but you do understand things by <laughs> making it. And in this case, you're remaking historical ways of presentation by entering the very design and remaking it, which generates understanding and insight. And so maybe it's a bit of a, a blunt and general question, but what did you understand? Like what, like what did you gain by doing it in terms of um, what did you not know before that you know now? Question. Yeah, again, but yeah. Um, well, some of the things that um, I realized through making this exhibition is, um, and this is your question also about the playgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why are you indeed pursuing uh, such a project? Um, and one of the key questions for me was to revisit the relationship between art and architecture. Mm -hmm. 
because it was uh, for the people that I studied, uh, the Smithsons and uh, Van Eyck, uh, very crucial. And they had artist friends, etc. So it's very different from today. Mm -hmm. um, and with the students, uh, we also went to uh, look at more uh, uh, contemporary uh, uh, designs, like the Stedelijk Base uh, design by Rem Koolhaas, uh, which is a very different exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the same time, it works with the same sort of collection, same sort of notions of avant-garde, etc. So what's, what's happening there? What, what is the relationship of the brand the Rem Koolhaas and his architecture to the art world of today in the Stedelijk Museum, which operates in a very different way than the Tate Gallery in the 60s, when the Smithsons were asked to do this major <laughs> show on, on developments uh, in, in the world of painting and sculpture. And uh, for me, it's so indeed, there is a touch of nostalgia there because it mm -hmm. feels as if something's been lost there. Uh, it's a kind of uh, intellectual, cultural project that, that seriously brings art and architecture together to see what might come out of this uh, uh, exchange and to make it productive. And you could even say that the architects especially needed the artists to further develop uh, architecture. Um, and uh, I'm sure there's examples of today, I don't want to be dismissive of certain practices, but that was at the core of the development of modern architecture at the time. And um, this so it helps to understand uh, things that are happening today. Uh, and uh, There are notions of continuity, but uh, th much more there are notions of disruption uh, also there. And um, yeah, so it's bringing ammunition to the current debate. That's that's what I hope for. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, yeah, uh, but that would be a next thing mm -hmm. to uh, develop, maybe uh, I, I don't know with others or in Rotterdam. I think I I learned different things, and sometimes it was a confirmation of a, a query I already yeah. had, and in a way it just deepened the query. It didn't answer it, and sometimes it was the opposite. I would say. I said this yesterday already, that for me the, the revelation was the Smithson's room mm -hmm. because I had expected that to be ugly and it's beautiful. Uh, and I think that, that that's really shown us that photographs do it no mm -hmm. justice mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the photographs are so savage and fierce that I didn't think it was going to be a beautiful experience and I think it, it is. But then in the case of the Smithson's, we have very good art, in fact. So there, the the whole experience is is one. The the paintings and the architecture <coughs> are a fantastic <coughs> pairing, a fantastic combination. And maybe, in fact, with Van Eyck, I, I've always been fascinated by that pavilion, as you said in the introduction. And I've always liked the inter in interrelationship between the texture of the concrete and the the spacing, which is which varies slightly from shallow to deeper, um, but it's a, a unified texture. But I think we let the <coughs> Van Eyck down a little, especially in the pavilion, because our sculptures were not so good in this case. So whereas with the Smithsons, we can give that mm, architecture, yeah. the painting it's, paintings it needs, mm. we can't quite give this space the sculptures it needs. Mm. And then with... Um, the question that I'm still thinking about, and I don't know if I'll get closer to an answer, but the show in a way uh, reasserts that question, is what is the difference between Albini and Bobardi? And, and when we think about this question of bringing the viewer closer to art and bringing art into the viewer's space, the real space of real life, what, what are they doing that's similar and different? Uh, and I've used the word aggressive in relation to Bobardi. I don't know if that's fair, but it seemed to me that she had a, a kind of violence in her attitude to the museum, which Albini never had. But I, I haven't got to an answer, but I find that thinking about the Albini approach to the, the pole and the easel, and whether it's about making the object more object-like or make, making it more, more special or less special. So making it more erratic, 
the word he used, or aulico, um, or making it more every day. And he, he seems to be doing the same thing at the same time, and two things at the same time. And I, I can't quite work that out. And in a way, I think that she's doing the same. Mm. And I happened to start the exhibition by the Albini side, ending with Bobardi. If you take the main entrance, you'll start with Bobardi and end with Albini. And they're sort of five zones next to each other. Is there a preferred sequence? Um, if, I, if I, so far in my guided tours, I've started at Albini. I think partly because I think the whole show is about um, the museum. So let's start at the museum end. And I, I think that um, it's interesting to go around the museum before starting to look at the exhibition. But, um, and Albini and uh, Scarpa, those projects are earlier. And Albin and uh, Bobardi is the latest project. So I would start at the Albini end. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but, but the answer is different uh, because you end then with uh, Bobardi, where you face all the backs mm -hmm. of the paintings. So there's, an, there's a strange moment of confusion what happens here. In the realm. Well, that yeah. brings me beautifully to my next question. Ah, okay. <laughs> There is um, yeah. recurring interest for the rear or the back. And I've just put some images yeah. together. Here it's the rear of the artwork that you can, as you just described, Albini indeed is, is he demystifying and at the same time granting every work a singular attention. They, they, they become, as if in a Giacometti sculpture, like a singular like a spine with, with a face or something. Um, and so that was one realization I had. But then, at some points in the exhibition, yeah. you effectively see the rear of the tree display uh, devices, schemes. So can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because it's, yeah. it's so evident. Yeah. And maybe let's start there. What, what about the rear? Yes, it's interesting, I think, that it, at the beginning this felt like, oh my God, this is like the dead zone. But it's not the dead zone. It's quite interesting. Um, and you can have this kind of clash between the backs. And some of the backs, of course, would have been seen originally. So the back of the Smithsons was evident. They'd, Could you see it in London? Um, you couldn't walk around it, but it was. No. this is how it was, is what I mean. That, that's. But it was not part of the experience no. then. No, but it was yeah. a freestanding wall. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had insisted, you could have gone to see how it looked. Yeah, there were funny curtains before the emergency exit, so you couldn't <laughs> fit <laughs> around. Mm. So, yeah, but, yeah. so it was a freestanding wall. It didn't pretend to be a solid wall. No. It was always a screen. Yeah. With, um, obviously, the, the Van Eyck, by taking that out of context, it... You see it in a different way, but you could have had that experience. And you would, you'd have never had that experience with Scarpa, because yeah. Scarpa was against a historic wall. So that's completely new. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. he also shows the construction of the display. He's in that sense also elaborately showing how it's holed up and how it's framed. It's, it's, it's not as if he is creating a a hermetic image that, that, that's uh, seamless. You mean it's honest? Yeah, and it articulates uh, the gesture of framing. Mm -hmm. but, you yeah. but you... Yeah. But you can't go behind it? No, no, it's, you can't go behind the scenes, no. no. Yeah, because uh, it's, it's really an interesting yeah. moment that you touch, literally, yeah. by making it and yeah. by isolating this <laughs> one element out of yeah. the Van Eyck, uh, is that, if I may, just yeah. w what is striking here is that this um, mode of presentation becomes almost an artistic strategy, literally even in the late 60s, early 70s, then 
known as institutional critique, so the revealing mm -hmm. of the whole nature of the artifice, of the structure, of the support. Mm -hmm. But while at that very same time, all the exhibition architecture has gone completely blank. So there's a kind of really interesting reversal that the kind of almost universal or transatlantic adoption of the formula of the white cube, yeah. while we're looking at uh, modes of presentation mm -hmm. 15 years earlier, not even that 15, 20, some, that were uh, allowing the viewer to understand what is happening and also what an artwork like this has gone through, where it has been shipped to, when it has been restored. So it's addressing the intelligence of the viewer. In, in, in the case of Bouvardé, she talks about being honest about the life of the mm -hmm. painting. But Rita pointed out to me that with Albini, it's in a way the opposite, that he smooths it out, covers the oh, back. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he writes about that. That's just what you've yes. observed. And what is totally internal. Yes. So um, one of the questions I asked myself uh, while making this show is indeed wh why would anybody still go to exhibitions? What are people actually looking for? Because it's all on Google or on the screen, in social media, or, or that's a story that some people tell you that's all out there in the social media. So why do you actually make an effort to visit <laughs> a special space and engage with the artwork there um, and one of the things that I try to explain in the essay although I only briefly touch on it is is that there is I think indeed a very important aspect that we overlook uh, when making exhibition uh, is, is that how um, the spatial experience and the bodily experience and how uh, all these uh, environments and experience are also material are crucial to the value or the the, 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 the aura or the, the special quality of an exhibition. Uh, that's also why it has to go, I think, because it's in the moment and in a certain space and certain time. Uh, so, so it's always sad when an exhibition is taken down, but it has to be taken down because otherwise it's not special anymore. And this, this, this notion that's material, and this is of course with Lina Bobardi uh, very much in your face, uh, th that you see the back of the construction and that, the, that you see the magic of what art is, that how an artist creates out of oil uh, and, and his, his, his uh, practice of being a painter, a, a, a magical image, a, a material image, that is something that we too often forget, I think, and it's uh, because you read it as, as, as some, it's naturalized all the time. So in a way, this is against the naturalization of our own practice, <laughs> that we should not take for granted that an exhibition is always there, etc. But that mm -hmm. it is maybe ritualized or uh, as a cultural practice, it is a practice of bodily absorbing special cultural notions and I, I think that's something very important to further develop and explore and uh, in that specific period it is important with the relationship with André Marot and his concept of the Musée Imaginaire where he starts to theorize uh, although using the 19th century he's also talking about the 1960s that art is uh, engaged in, in, in a media complex mm -hmm. which, which, which creates a very different sort of experience of art and uh, or at least a different sort of value how we look at art and uh, and in this moment of uh, digitalization and it's almost a cliche but I think it's really fair to keep that in mind that it is an important moment that, that the digitalization transforms all sorts of notions, cultural notions, uh, experiential notions, that, that uh, material and the bodily experience and how art, etc., is material. But th that is yeah. part of this project, I would say. Yeah, would you say that's one of the uh, reasons and also the importance of the show to go back to a moment that was pre the digital age? Yeah. It was not, yeah. there was of course yeah. the reproduction of the image already, but not in the yeah. same kind of speed. No, yeah. And, uh, 
massive distribution yeah. as we know it now. It's maybe easier to explain why, uh, so uh, when David Bowie died, there was this tons of interviews of David Bowie around. And one of the things he made very clear is that when he was young and starting as a uh, musician, it was very hard to get by the new music and the records, etc. And that you would have to go to certain shops and cities and friends to actually listen to the latest album and to mm. hear that music. And now the music is everywhere, you know, it's, it's with the Spotify and the streaming. And the same is with the art. You have to go to the Stalig Museum to see the latest development in the arts. Mm. And now it's just like that, straight from so on eFlux and whatever platform, there is, it's immediately branded and all over the world. So there's a, there's a different so um, but cycle. But we, we were able to go back to some of the museums which haven't changed so much. So yeah. we, could we went to Genoa, we went to Venice, yeah. you went to uh, Sao Paulo, which has been reconstructed. Yeah. So with museums, you know, we're talking about 50 years ago, but many of them yeah. had mm. retained quite a lot of the original mm. designs. Mm. Uh, it was with the temporary exhibitions, of course, that it's harder, especially with the early Van Eyck temporary exhibitions. Mm. Um, and the Smithson, as far as I know, this is the first time the Smithson show has been reconstructed, yeah. whereas some of the earlier Smithsons have been reconstructed yeah. quite intensively. Yeah. I think you do learn a lot. It's a bit like the difference between I mean, uh, eating a recipe and cook, making a recipe and cooking a recipe. No, sorry, <laughs> what am I saying? Um, <laughs> the difference between eating, eating a cake and making a cake. You, you learn uh, how things work. And I think that just installing the Albinis, you began to understand that are we looking at a line? Are we looking at a triangle? Are we thinking about this as an enfilade? Is the fact that one of the paintings is so horizontal, anti-Albini, is that a problem? Should they all be more like people? like a kind of image on a pole. Um, so you you learn things you don't ex even know you hadn't known about. Mm. Once you start to yeah. uh, recreate and reinstall, mm. you think, oh, I see, this needs to be here to make sense. Mm. You, you, you don't know that from a photograph. Mm. Mm. I, I wonder, it's, it's returning to something we discussed uh, early on in this discussion, is to what extent that is also uh, experiential or experientially available to the viewer mm. I think it is so maybe the, the question is is also part of the relevance and the importance of doing these types of shows of revisiting modes of display that predate the treatment and um, way of dealing with images that we know now because they disrupt the certain kind of ease we we are used to and you know, talking about disruption, they're very different modes of disruption. I wonder to what extent viewers experience this really as a disruption, as Bobardi to an extent is. So if you're telling that people are looking at the artworks, somehow they forget they are looking at something that's pretty much visible and in your face, and still they don't see it. Or do they see it? I think it's this really interesting question of how... Um, the intervention and the mediation that happens through display architecture uh, helps you to understand what you're doing. Is it consuming an image or, as the woman did, sitting down, mm. taking the time and seeing this beautiful surrounding, the garden in the back. So sometimes, at some point, I think duration enters. Yeah. So in what is interesting in most of the examples or it's that you discuss in the book. I think most of the examples in the show are semi-permanent exhibitions. What is the importance of temporariness, the temporal quality of some of these installations? They were not meant to last. They were um, yeah, interventions in time with a certain duration. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to make them re-intervene in our time? Because I wonder to what extent they look historical to someone who's not knowledgeable yeah. about this history. Or whether they look contemporary. Yes, exactly. Which would be a great strength, or not, I guess. Um, uh, with the, those uh, early Van Eyck's, Dirks talked a lot about how 
the artists were invited to make a show, the space was far too big. So the architect had to say to the artist, make some more work, quickly, <laughs> now. Um, so he was really in close relationship with the artists and they were doing it on the spot, nearly. The Smithsons wasn't quite the same, but again, it was, it was very quick and I think they made very, um, they had to make their solutions rapid, really rapidly. I, I think the, uh, the museum here is extremely slow. I mean, the, the Gulbenkian Museum was really almost entirely planned by 58, 59, but it didn't happen for 10 years. Um, and most, but most of the, even the, the, those long-term projects like the Genoa projects, um, they were pretty quick. Yeah. And I, I think, my, my feeling is that one of the uh, joys that they had and that we, in a sense, were able to experience again was that I think after the war they took risks, you know, they, were, they wanted to make things happen. And uh, they did a, they could do things with art in a way that we can't do now because we're very, very careful in a way that people weren't careful with art 50 years ago. Um, There's an ur different urgency, yeah. Mm. Yes. And, uh, you know, most exhibitions, you have to make all your decisions in advance because there's going to be couriers and the courier will have to see the work on the wall before they go and then you can't change it. So we had the joy that because the works were from our collection, yeah. we could make changes. So quite a lot of yeah. those sculptures ended up being in different places than we had originally man mm. managed. Yeah, we, we didn't really go into the, the, the different, let's say, regimes of our yeah, so, so art today is uh, um, so also well. You can tell it by uh, showing the, the reconstruction of the Sao Paulo uh, Museum, where the it's impossible to do the really original sort of approach because it's it's too fragile and too dangerous, too risky for the artworks. And artworks are now behind glass itself, so you have two glass plates at least in front of you, which creates a very different sort of experience. But in terms of security, insurance, uh, the, the, the value of art in terms of capital, that's a, there's a whole different system in place now. So, so also in terms of the Cobra exhibition, I mean, those were immediately made, these uh, paintings, as you say. So th th they weren't uh, uh, so many million euros uh, of value today, which creates a very different way of mm -hmm. dealing with and hanging and showing them, etc. With the students, we had s a few discussions about, but not not too many. The air conditioning, the censoring, the light, all there's a whole, yeah, in Michel Foucault term, sort of new regime has come down on the art mm -hmm. world, which was not the case in that period. Well, there were different yeah. uh, regimes, but yeah. but maybe returning to that, I don't know if we can find an answer whether. It looks contemporary oh or yeah, yeah, historical, a but question, yeah. there is a I historical. Think, I think the uh, the earliest projects here by Van Eyck from forty nine and fifty one. Mm -hmm. I, I think they look quite contemporary. Yeah, I think they could have been made mm. now. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I suppose the Smithsons also looks pretty contemporary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, because what you were saying about the um, reconstruction of the Bobardi design in Sao Paulo. So you could argue then that your reconstruction is more faithful than the one in Brazil. Okay. Want to comment just, just for fun, I think, say I think yes. it is, it is because, <laughs> and we were able to do that because it's a temporary exhibition. Yeah. Yeah. Because if we'd been making this for a museum, we couldn't have made those solutions. Mm -hmm. Because walking through the exhibition, you encounter uh, invariably the, the desire for truth because you encounter something that s almost all of them I knew through images because I've seen mm -hmm. them in the books I've studied. Mm -hmm. So suddenly there is the moment you re-encounter them while you've never seen them unless through imagery. And so you wonder to what extent you can touch history, like the historical artifact, while you know it's a reconstruction. Mm. So to what extent did you mm. uh, consider the quest for truth or truthfulness as a guiding principle on the level of the object, mm. as in 
these pedestals of, of Bobardi or truthful to the type of experience that they tried to produce at the time that you might yes. want to reconstruct? I think we did. I, th I think mm. the exhibition is in good faith. Mm. Um, and it's not in any way ironic or... Oh, no. Um, no. There's no kind of detournement. It's, yeah. it's what, what you see is what you get. Yeah. And we tried to understand what we were seeing, whether it was an original object in Genoa or a photograph in the case of the Stedelijk. Mm. We tried... I mean, we were poring over those photographs. It was ridiculous because <laughs> they're very small. Yeah. And uh, limit, the, the information they give is limited. But we tried our best. But it's truthful, right? It's not, it's not the truth. It's <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> the idea of historical reconstruction, you inevitably yeah. meet yeah. the requirement or the question, yeah. to what extent is this like it was? Yeah. And I think you circumvent in a very, very um, um, subtle way that question, in a sense that, and I guess it's the presence of the Gulbenkian collection that does the magic trick. Because then yeah. what you're displaying becomes almost secondary to the art. What is happening in the... In, in a success. I, I do, yeah, I think I do. I've only seen the show yesterday and I've, yes. I didn't uh, leave sleep to it, but uh, you know, I've, I've been thinking since yesterday, what is it that makes this, strong, this show powerful and strong mm -hmm. And where's the magic that I do think is happening? And I think it's the moment that you forget you're looking at a show on display. Yeah. And I think then the display is effectively working mm -hmm. and generating an experience that is genuine. Mm -hmm. And you have indeed that, so there's the self-reflexive moment of the pole without a painting. So then you're drawn back to the reality of maybe the subject of the show. But I like the fact that you're swinging between uh, looking at art in the Smithson's uh, part, I was fully taken by the art. I was not photographing at first the exhibition architecture. I was photographing the paintings because I thought <coughs> they were stunning. Mm. So I think for a show that you, that you forget about what the show is at some point and you're generally into an experience, I would consider that kind of a merit, no? Uh, I still have Ooh. another question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this More is the questions. rear, fascination for the rear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, this one I particularly liked yeah. as well, because you get corridors, and I effectively sneaked into one of these <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, corridors Delicious, yeah. just to uh, know or to try and find, um, find out how it was made. But I guess my last... Oh, no, sorry, but but it was deliberate to make it uh, open. Mm. I mean, we could have closed that off, but it, that seemed wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my last question, if I look at time, I think, yeah, we'll go back to this one. I think there's a, an interesting sequence, even though we talked about the preference or the preferred way of entering the exhibition. There is an interesting tension between, if we say Albini is the left and Bobari is the right, that you start <coughs> from display devices that single out a work, that make it singular, yeah. like one painting on a pole. And then you end, <coughs> and it's like 14, 15 years in between, or something, that you go to multiple presentation. Yeah. So you go from the singular yeah. to the multiple, and also something, for, f something that is private and yeah. almost domestic towards a public situation. Can you tell us something about how that mode of display obviously relate to a shifting awareness of the, the um, mode of address that an exhibition has? And we're talking about the post-war era indeed, that there is an urgency of trying to find out what it means to show art. Artists are, only, are in a parallel way trying to find out what it means to make and to add to a world that you know is fundamentally cruel. And so does that shift also represent a shift in awareness that is f has to do with a more democratic way of thinking? Or So 
the entrance of the public as as a as a visual presence with Bobardi is it's like an an army is a bad term. It's like mass multiplicity yeah. that you you encounter a mass of almost faces. So the 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 connotations are plural. Yes. And from Albini is you and the artwork, and you can manipulate it on your own. So you're alone to in company of others. But you're, you're making the same kind of comparisons that I have been making, but I, now I'm wondering whether they're right or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's, it's been quite easy to say, let's begin with Albini, the single pole, and end with uh, Bobardi, the mass. And what does that mean in relation to, you know, for example, old Europe and new Brazil? Um, and the political regimes also. Yes, yeah. and, the, and the idea of the, the, poli the polite interior, the bourgeois interior, and the, the crowd on the square, mm -hmm. say. It's quite easy to make those, um, I suppose, quite glib descriptions. But I, I don't know in the end how true they are. I think I've always been, I, I've known that image of the Bobardi mass for uh, years. But in fact, when you come into our exhibition and experience them, you, as we've seen and we've talked about, you forget about the mass and you begin to look at the object. Mm -hmm. And whereas in the photographs it's lots of images, when you're in the room it's objects again. Um, so I, it's difficult, I think, in the in the end, to make those. I mean, and both. You can say that that's only that. Yeah. So that Albini yeah. is only this. And, and both Albini it. and mm -hmm. uh, Bobardi talk about the democ democratization of art, mm -hmm. but it means different things for them, or they do it in different ways. And uh, Albini mm -hmm. also is interested in opening up the museum to a new public, and he talks about that. He Albini writes very little, but. What he does write, he is certainly aware of a new role for the museum after the war, uh, to attract new publics and to be more part of real life. Mm -hmm. So he's not interested in putting art on the proverbial pedestal. He is interested in finding ways to make it more real. So I think, I, I feel that I've been guilty of a overgeneralization in comparing Albini and Bobardi. Mm. Um, we, nev we never suggest that there's a, there's a kind of linear or chronological development uh, beneath so this... Pro the show yeah, in its disposition yeah. also does not yeah. suggest that, no. that okay. there's a sequence mm, yeah. that you just follow and then... Yeah. That as if Bobardi would be the result of a, a process. Um, well, yeah. We did originally think that we might be able to do that, but yeah. then mm. with Fields. a more intensive look at what examples yeah. we might use, we thought it's actually quite hard, if not impossible, to establish a chronology. Mm -hmm. And for a final question, certainly Albini, also Scarpa, they, their first work also had to deal with commercial commissions. So they gained some of their experience in displaying commodities. I think we all know the Olivetti shop in, in, in Venice. Um, and if I understood well, Albini even had his in initial experience under the fascist regime. So these are quite different regimes, so to say, than the world of art. To what extent did they come in, not necessarily as a negative influence, but I think in terms of democratization, there are some strategies that could be lent there that, that were maybe suitable to what extent do you still read that into what you're showing here, like the the whole shop window design, fashion design, that they were, I think, eagerly looking at as well, or not? And that's the part I'm the least knowledgeable about, mm. but that I think is um, like a question hoovering also over a project like this. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to think of. I mean, because architects move between such different domains. Yeah, so if you mm -hmm. take someone like Lili Reich and Mies van der Rohe, who also developed exhibition di displays for fairs, commercial fairs, uh, most beautiful work. Um, 
and the Smiths is doing the House of the Future at the Daily Mail Ideal Home uh, exhibition. Um, so m maybe, but this is really speculation. For them, it was also a kind of uh, sanctuary to work with uh, uh, art exhibitions, yeah. where these. Um, so the House of the Future had to engage with product placements, <laughs> which is not, which is hardly ever talked about in. Uh, in architecture history, because it's too banal, but it's <laughs> really part of of the mm -hmm. job. And uh, th well, I don't think this is product placement. To be honest, it's it's really <laughs> something else. No, but there's, but a, there's a tendency yeah. to be condescending or not taking it as serious as high art or high end commissions. Ah, yeah. But. Um, but display techniques, when you yeah. think of display models, that there are obvious similarities. Yes, mm -hmm. that's that's all. Uh, and it would be uh, uh, would it be a next project? That's the easy way out. <laughs> but, <that's laughs> but I think there's 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 in 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 organizing a gaze a gaze a certain way of looking at things or environments and experiencing an environment. There are definitely uh, lessons from mm -hmm. uh, taken. Yes, yeah. I, I think that. Scarpa is wonderfully photogenic, and mm -hmm. that must mm -hmm. relate to the, the the mise en place or mise en scène of a, an object to sell. Uh, I think uh, Albini, although we have found some beautiful photographs which we've put in the catalogue, it's he's not so obviously photogenic, mm -hmm. and I think more three dimensional. I feel he's more having you walk round the space. Maybe even in your head, but whereas uh, Scarpa is much more of the the frontal image, which is like kind of locks an image in your mind, and and for me Albini is more th three dimensional. Um, Albini did compete uh, in fascist competitions, but I think he was le he's less closely connected to commerce than Scarpa. Uh, Sc Scarpa really is trained in, in product, uh, what, making products look more desirable. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a strange thing, to, uh, very ambivalent, because the Sonsbeek uh, exhibition, the open air exhibition, the alderman who instigated it learned from uh, the London uh, show, the Battersea Park show, and he thought it's a good idea to stimulate tourism uh, to a, d a war destroyed city uh, that Arnhem was. Uh, so, and tourism was a different thing then, of course, than it is today. But it, it shows, of course, that art is not, not uh, uh, an autonomous practice and certainly not art curating and art institutions. Uh, but, but still, there yeah, d then it was different, I would say, th to make create, to bring in an audience in an open air exhibition even though it w might have been for tourism, I it was mo there was much more a cultural ambition, I would say, uh, than, um, uh, than if, y if you just speak of tourism today. But, but um, people can uh, disagree, of course. Okay, I just looked. We have another 15 minutes, 12 minutes. So There's no cutoff time, so you can... Ah, okay, but I thought maybe it's a moment to open up to the to the room, if there are any questions. Yes, please, there's a microphone in the back. So if you can tell us shortly who you are and what oh, your question. Hi, um, my name is Rain Booth. Um, I'm a curator from Dublin. Um, I just wanted to say firstly, thank you for creating such a, a wonderful experience. Um, I felt like uh, I'd seen photographs of those spaces in the past, but actually to be inside of them um, was a completely different, unusual and kind of a special moment mm -hmm. um, and I wonder my question is do you think that there's something that contemporary curators and contemporary artists can learn from um, these approaches from architecture from like it's such a it's a different experience in terms of contemporary display I'll, I'll Maybe redirect <laughs> a part of your question because um, you said at some point there's 
no exhibition design. Uh. So maybe rephrasing your question is, how much curating was involved as we understand curating today? Yeah. Because curating in art is creating larger narratives and often a narrative at the benefit of the one who's telling and artworks are being made subservient to larger narratives. In this case, maybe your question is, what can we learn mm -hmm. in curating, in uh, accommodating artworks in a way that here, I think, happen in a very generous manner? That is, so that moment when it flips, maybe, that you look at the display, and at the same time, you're suddenly taken by an artwork. So what's the balance? It, firstly, I, I think I would say the designer and the curators, um, in, in my view, maybe I'm deceiving myself, I think we've tried to step back a bit so that Rita's design is not in your face because sh she was trying to accommodate other architects' solutions in the fairest way. Uh, and I feel that we're not pr presenting a. I don't know. Maybe this is. Maybe I'm deceiving myself. I, I feel it's. It's like it's almost like we're setting out a number of pieces. Which, obviously, we made the selection. We did the research to try and get it right. But I now feel that it's up to the viewers to take away what they want from it. I, 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 feel, I don't feel that we're saying, <coughs> there's, there's no end message, yeah. I don't think. It depends on the curators, what their questions are, I suppose, too. Yeah, it's, so if you have a question, yeah. Does that mean it's undesigned and uncurated? <laughs> no, yeah, they are really, yeah. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's the moment when the curating <laughs> takes over. And, or maybe that's what your question is, or um, I've lost my question now. And, uh, if I, yeah, it's really, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's, what I like about uh, the, 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 the positions that we chose and how we try to approach them, and it's, it's, it's also a bit too peaceful, but we try to give space to the visitors to actually find out yourself or, or tr tr try to, to, to under so like the lady sitting in the chair just to contemplate it and, and, and take it in in your own way or your own tempo, your, uh, your own pace. Um, it's too peaceful because I, I think you said Bobardi is aggressive with all, I mean with all, is that a generalizing statement? This is generalizing, but all curatorial gestures and architectural gestures are in a way there is always a certain amount of aggression there because you're creating a, yeah, a way of looking at things. So, so it's directive, at least, in a way, even though it wants to be it generous and, <laughs> and create space for you to... I, yeah. I suppose that was maybe what I was trying to get at in terms of in contemporary display now. Which is, um, thank you. In, in displays of contemporary art now, are, is it maybe a little bit too... Or are we... Um, following too much uh, what's gone before, or are we not following enough what's gone before? Like, could we be more um, brave in terms of like what these architects put forward, and how much of it is led by the artist, and how much of it is led by the architect, and how much is led by the curator? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, we could start all over question. again now. Um, <laughs> I mean, in some cases, we're looking at um, a very contemporary moment in which uh, the architects and the artists are uh, exactly contemporary, whereas someone like Albini was working almost always with historical material and Scarpa too. Um, I, 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 do f I do feel that we keep coming back to this period because it was remarkable and provided some solutions that are very enduring. And for me, that's the... Um, the good and the bad thing about working at the Gulbenkian Museum is that it's hard to make it better than it was. Um, you, you know, whereas it, it, it's, um, it's also a museum of objects and objects get very fixed, whereas paintings tend to move much more freely. Um, 
And then there are other solutions which haven't endured. But I, I guess we, we didn't um, set out to look at you know, what worked and what didn't work. Uh, and we, there wasn't enough space to do that properly. And I think what we wanted was to choose fewer and do them better so that people could be in them and experience them. We could have chosen more, then it would have been more archival uh, and it would have been a, more of a survey. And this is mm -hmm. it's not a survey. But on the other hand, it was interesting when we, at, at the very beginning, I think I, I showed Dirk five or six photographs of things that had interested me, and I said, this is just a start, let's see what else we can add to it. And we didn't find so much, in fact, in terms of key uh, models or remarkable moments. Um, with the Smithsons, we thought about the other projects they'd done. With Albini, of course, in the end, we made a collage. Um, we looked uh, for, sh for a brief time at Manfred Lembrook, the, the son of the sculptor Wilhelm Lembrook, because he did some interesting things in Germany. Uh, we have nothing from Germany here. Um, what, what else did you, do you remember we thought yeah, about? And also, where to start was the question. <coughs> uh, and uh, which, uh, wh wh where do you draw the line in terms of avant-garde development? So the Rietveld show for, for the Stel at MoMA, um, which is a fascinating show, but it seems to be, even though it was in the 50s, it seems to be of a different period or different ambition. The, 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 the Kiesler show uh, was also an uh, important moment. But yes. Uh, I guess Kiesler, Peggy Guggenheim, those yeah. are some of the more famous ones that we see again and again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's I think I was trying to formulate maybe um, what also one of the... Uh, okay, this one? Okay. <laughs> At the end, I use a microphone. <laughs> there you go. Um, you just said it's not a it's not a catalog or, or something a survey. Yeah. I think one of the strengths is that you put to practice the historical examples you chose, rather than displaying them as they were artifacts. It's by by entering their the very logic that you're trying to show, I guess that's where the strength probably lies. And so, responding to your question, I think the. Um, the show works on two levels. You have the historical level and then the contemporary level, which is the, the show we're looking at. And I think at both levels, there's quite a lot to understand. You can return to the historical examples to try and find out by experiencing them now um, what they had to offer. But I guess the very dealing by the two cu curators with those historical models provides an additional, not lesson, but experience or, or an entry into understanding. Of, of what mediation on the level of display and architecture could potentially entail. Um, that's how far I am now in understanding what I've seen yesterday and today again. Yeah. Another question, please, yeah, in the back. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Ricardo Agares. I'm an architect, architectural historian. I was. Um, I was just thinking that walking into the exhibition, and I only visited once, uh, it feels a bit like walking into history and at the same time walking into an experiment. So it actually, I think, matches a bit of what you're saying. It, it is still experimental. I find that fascinating. It, it, you're you're ex experimenting with something historical still today. Um, my question is, um, and also uh, another note is to <laughs> completely disagree with Penelope. I really feel like the, the works of art stand out very, very freshly and with a strength that I was not expecting. So it, it's am amazing for the works of art. I was curious about the labeling um, that you mentioned. And that seems like a very, very provocative touch <laughs> in the exhibition. Uh, wondering whether you consider the original labeling um, of the displays and how this played out in your uh, final choice, uh, because I, I don't know uh, the history of labeling in exhibitions, but I think numbering is kind of recent, uh, relatively recent thing. Maybe it was already at the Smithsons. Maybe the so so how did this? Yeah, we looked at it, and we um, in some. 
of the examples, we had enough information, we could have recreated it, then we would have had five or six different systems of labelling, but we didn't actually have enough information for all of the examples. Um, and it, I think it seemed like, in the end, we were going to get a bit precious if we tried to recreate the labelling as well. We knew that Bobardi had been interested to put the labels behind, to make people walk behind. Um, and with Albini, very often they're kind of attached to the side um, in a funny w funny way. Um, but then I think that we didn't know with, with Van Eyck, we didn't know. There was no sign, no oh, sign. I know, the handout. Um, the Smithsons had big numbers, so in a way the Smithsons gave us the clue for the, the way we did the rest of the exhibition. I think that we tried to keep it m modest and um, low-key, mm -hmm. unremarkable. Yes, and... and, and um but the labelling is important for, for the... Well, important, yeah. It's an important question for uh, how to um, s surface the visitor. But um, especially in the Tate Gallery, there was there was an adamant, there was really an ambition to create a, uh, an experience uh, of immersion, and also the they were called the selectors, not the curators of the exhibition. They also made a statement in the catalog that uh, all this talk and explanation and theorizing is is not it ru ruins it or is not really necessary. You have to go in there experience the art and, and uh, they don't say enjoy it they say it's hard work and they say it's uh, it talks of uh, all sorts of emotions and irrationalities and that by going uh, undergoing it you will recognize similar sort of emotions that are raging inside your own body as well it's really kind of stream of consciousness uh, essay in that catalog that uh, provokes you uh, not to theorize but to uh, to have a sort of um, yeah uninhibited Un <laughs> not quite in yeah so that, that's interesting so th therefore labels labels that all also come in the way of this notion of experience and lena of course says that i i, I also want to see the people to view it as work that artworks are work uh, and that you enjoy it and appreciate it as such, and and no no theory, please. And, yeah. Somebody wants to take the final last question. Yes, please. I guess it's just a very short question, but um, coming back to your your suggestion, there are of course many artists who take up uh, models like this. I'm thinking of Jutta Köter, for example, who's using glass easels in her work since many years. But what I wanted to ask uh, the panel or Penelope is, like, are we going to see these display supports again in other exhibitions in the future? Is that possible? Meaning in this institution, will the, will you keep them in the storage and possibly be able to pull them out again? <laughs> Is this a question about recycling? <laughs> no, it's not a question about recycling. It's not an ecological hint. It's um, more. Um, about the idea of exper being able to experiment with these or other display systems that have roots in history um, in exhibitions that are not um, centered on the idea of debating exhibition design. Meaning... Like you would build walls again, won't you? Um, I, I don't have a, 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 con a proper answer. I think that we, we now we have we know we know more. We have more solutions, you might say. Um, I think that some parts literally will be stored. Um, it, just by the way, the Robin Fuhr exhibition, for example, downstairs is entirely made of the material from the previous exhibition upstairs. So. Um, Sometimes it is a question of being able to recycle uh, and finding solutions through that. Um, 
I, I don't know whether you're asking me personally or us institutionally, or, you know, whether we're going to see this again and again. I mean, it's um, of course we're going to see this again and again. And Wendelin van Oldenburg has been using those uh, glass easels in a show in um, a Van Abbe Museum some years ago. We have glass easels similar in, in Guimarães for the masks of uh, José de Guimarães, the African masks and from the collection of José de Guimarães. Um, it's just a, a question of how you classify, how you're going to classify it, uh, are you going to classify it, the supports now as semi-artworks or artworks that will be stored uh, next to artworks in your storage and if I or any artist in the room would come along and would want to use them again in the future, is there a possibility? Um, potentially, and I, I now realize that the clever answer to your question is that well, these things are going to Rotterdam. <laughs> so the question is, what happens after Rotterdam? Where will they be? And it'll be very interesting because this show will look completely different in Rotterdam because the spaces are so different and there will be a different architect working on it. So that will, it'll be an interesting moment to have a, a similar kind of conversation to see how things change and what, what pertains and is continual and what doesn't continue. I'm sorry, I really, I don't, really don't know the answer. <laughs> Can I say, uh, well, we have a policy of recycling uh, as much as possible, but that's the, that's the not so. No, I think, uh, well, for me, it's um, the beauty of an exhibition is that it w will will be gone after the exhibition taken down again and can be reused in a sensible way by different people but I don't think it's a didactic tool that you put somewhere in a room and then take out for another exercise so but but I don't know if that's that's your idea that you want to uh, present to us to every year bring out one uh, new uh, display system uh, um, of course in a couple of instances instances we looked at other people's reproductions. Yes. So um, we discovered that the Bobardi had been recreated in a Spanish museum. Do you remember which one? I forget. But it, in fact, the reconstructions weren't very good. <laughs> so we didn't go back to them. Uh, we d thought it was that was that was pointless. Um, and there was n there were one or two other examples where we could have used the reconstructions, but. Th they weren't accurate enough. In, in conceptual terms, you're looking at reenactments, and, and, and the reenactment has a limited period in time and place, and then maybe someone else will take up the challenge of another reenactment. Sorry, for the foundation of the Bobardi Foundation. Um, Scarpa are the original easels, so they are from the Museo Correr. Final question still? No? Then I'd like to end on a sentence that Penelope just uttered a few minutes ago, that we know more and we have more solutions. If that's the outcome of this discussion, I'd be a happy man. Thanks to Penelope Curtis and Dirk van den Neuvel. And thank you for coming. Please, please don't run away. We have a second discussion starting at five. So please uh, join us again, have a coffee, but don't run. Yeah.
uh, came back and welcome <laughs> for the first time, for those who are here for the first time. I'm just going to um, explain <coughs> the next part because we have here a man whose name I find it difficult to say, Hus or Gustav Boimer, who is the director of the new institute in Rotterdam. And uh, you, as you may have uh, taken in, the exhibition will travel to Rotterdam uh, from Lisbon and will open there next summer. And it's been very interesting to think about how that exhibition might um, take a new shape in Rotterdam. So um, in part two, we're moving away from the exhibition that we have here to think more broadly. And Hus was invited to choose someone to talk with, um, partly uh, because of the architecture triennial that's happening now in Lisbon, but also in relation to the special visit of the friends of the new institute who are here with us. So this is a kind of tripartite uh, evening between the Gulbenkian, the Triennale, and Rotterdam New Institute. So that's, that's the reason for this um, coming together. And now I'm going to hand over to Hus, and um, you can get started. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Penelope. <laughs> and before we, we're going to start, I want to, uh, you could say, project my gratitude to the woman who is just sitting. Uh, Penelope Curtis, because uh, I think there was a beautiful, um, almost parallel moment is that um, we started talking when, because uh, uh, Penelope was reflecting upon the Kubenkian as, as she already introduced, and this particular role of the interior, which, you know, was some way clouded in mystery and needed to be reflected upon. Uh, an interesting thing is that for us, we, were, we just started an, an institute, which was even referred to as a new institute. Uh, and you could say that, you know, at, at the same moment we arrived at, uh, at the conclusion that we needed to reflect a little bit on the, on the instruments which were given to us as cultural institutes. Uh, and this led uh, both to a program but also to this particular project. And I think for us it's, it's quite marvelous that, you know, you suddenly embed certain conversation in a, in a much larger historical context. And I would like to express my that you've made it possible. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to uh, say something about this man sitting next to me. Um, I think that, that, that the domain of, 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 uh, of exhibition design is either highly theoreticized, theoreticized, is that a word? Huh? Or, or, or simply ignored. Huh? Uh, it, it's funny. So either you have a very, very, very specialist type of conversation or everybody will go, uh, what are we talking about now? Um, in that, in that, 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 that field of, 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 of strange diversities, there, there are a few people which uh, I'm, I'm totally attracted to, uh, but I never have the chance to talk to them because people are always busy. You know, they're always gone, they're always on the road. This is the man which I would love to talk to for years already, but it's simply impossible for me to talk to them because he's always en route. Um, and he is one of the people who, you could say, transcends certain disciplinary conditions. He operates very much from a, a commercial domain, but also within the field of culture. And, and he's extremely interested in something which I heard him talk about once in Delft, which was the phenomenon of staging. And to me, the notion of staging uh, in, in relationship to, to exhibition design was relatively new, you could say, that I thought, hey, this, because to me, it was immediately also introducing it into the domain of the theatrical. Uh, and, and in other words, the performative. Uh, and I thought that's a, okay, you know, this is a kind of rhetoric I didn't know. Anyway, thanks again to the woman in green. I was given the possibility to, to introduce a conversation uh, with this man, which, which I can never speak to because he's always busy, and now he sits next to me. Um, so I'm very happy that he is here. Um, he obviously is an architect. Uh, he works for a rather prestigious office called OMA. And the interesting thing of that particular office is that they are very interested in museolo museological practices and have reflected it on that on, on a variety of occasions and, and, and through, you could say, also this particular man. So what we decided upon, can I say it? Is that okay? Is it, yeah, okay. Is that is, is simply to have a conversation with each other, which of course will fail because you never have a, you know, how many times do you have a, a conversation with people you really do not know and everybody eavesdrops. So it's going to be quite a complex thing, but we're going to do it. And uh, we decided to do it through 
through material which we made, we made exhibitions in the past. Uh, the only thing which, and I think we made it very explicit, is that we do not want a kind of conversation about, you could say, the historical models which were uh, produced and shown here in this uh, wonderful institute. And you could say our practice, which is maybe considered to be more current. In fact, you could say in line with uh, uh, Dirk uh, as an historian, he always tells me, Gustav, there is no past and there is no future. There's only a here and now. So we're going to present also our project simply as possible models, as possible approaches, uh, as formats. Uh, which we would like to read maybe in terms of uh, continuity, but that's up to you, uh, but certainly not as a, as, as, a, as a past and a present. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, the Good Banking Foundation, for having me, and thank you, Goods, for inviting me. Uh, yeah, like Goose said, it's, it's basically we put together a sort of catalog of uh, previous production, and the catalog only collaterally touches upon some of the things that have been discussed here and in the exhibition, but also reflects on maybe contemporary new notions of institutions of how cultural spaces are actually dealing with the idea of exhibitions, which is under threat and attack to a certain extent. So um, I love the exhibition that we've seen today. Um, I think it's it's basically a, an incredibly um, clear picture of a golden moment in uh, architectural exhibition making and in architecture in general. Maybe a moment that cannot be really replicated. Times have changed and maybe the architect is not any longer in the center of the conversation. Uh, and we were discussing just before, uh, you know, this morning, uh, that one of the transformative, uh, let's say, factors of our practice is that while in those years, those years represented by the exhibition, in the exhibition, the architect was, act was acting as a sort of director of an orchestra. Now this is almost impossible. You are crushed between protocols, standards, other expertises. So I personally, and disciplinarily, don't really believe in the autonomy of the discipline of architecture. And in a way, what you will see also has to deal with that. Um, I start, but yes, then it's start. going to be basically a sort of um, yeah one-to-one uh, -one, uh, conversation with a project that we uh, we were commissioned by Fondazione Prada, and it was basically the restaging. Uh, so this is actually an exhibition as a stage or as restaging, uh, similar to what you've done here, um, of a very iconic exhibition um, curated by an, a very <laughs> iconic curator, Harold Seaman, in Bern in 1969. So there is a date that links us also. Um, that's why we, we wanted to start from this one. So when Attitude became form, which was basically staged um, in 1969 uh, by Harold Seaman uh, in the Kunsthalle of Bern, where a generation of incredible young artists of uh, those years sort of gathered together to produce site-specific installations in negotiation. So they were sharing the same space and they were sharing the frictions that was coming from actually, you know, the having to work, conceptualize in the same space. The Kunsthalle of Bern uh, was basic, became basically the home of a sort of live process where calibers such as Joseph Boyce, uh, um, Michael Heiser, Alighiero Boetti uh, from Italy, uh, basically um, occupy the spaces of the Kunsthal with a number of site-specific works. It was also the launch moment of the Arte Povera uh, under the Manifesto Germano Celant, who was actually the curator of the 2013 reenactment. Um, we were asked a sort of impossible um, task. So how do you basically restage something that was meant to be site-specific? It was meant to be for a specific moment and a specific place in a place like this, which is the home of the Fondazione Prada in Venice. It's called Ca Corner della Regina. It's a late 18th century palazzo. Um, what we did was basically take the... <coughs> the exercise very literally. So we sort of did uh, quite in-depth archival research, like you guys did in this case. Uh, and we tried to reconstruct one-to-one -one in the palazzo, the Venetian palazzo, the Kunsthalle in Bern, not the existing one, 
the one which actually was home of the 1969 uh, exhibition. And in order to do that, we traveled to LA and we sort of took pictures. Uh, and we, we only had to work with pictures because the, that exhibition being something that was informal and produced basically on the spot did not really have true archival material. So we had to take pictures here. You see a very young Saul Lewitt. Um, and we had to deconstruct all these elements and sort of create our own catalog of an architecture that was not existing any longer. Uh, so this was basically, this is Joseph Boyce, and so we sort of mapped all these archi archival pictures or those few archival pictures which have been left from this special moment. And we simply reconstructed what we thought. And this, of course, there is always a moment of translation between the original and the reconstruction, what we thought or what we sort of, uh, um, what we thought from our studies uh, was the actual Kunstalimber in 1969. The operation was highly controversial and I, we, we received a lot of criticism because of course, how do you restage something that was meant to be you know, specific for a moment in time and for a specific place? And what we got was basically a space which was floating in time and, uh, and, and, and space also sort of staged, but also simulacrum of the original exhibition. So you, you see basically the comparisons between the original space and the new space in the Venetian Palazzo where of course the <coughs> backdrop of the Baroque building was actually very present and therefore changed completely the meaning of the exhibition itself. Lawrence Weiner did this piece on the original staircases of the Kunsthalle in, in, uh, in Bern, so we did the same, of course. Uh, Daniel Buren was not invited uh, in the original exhibition and he simply reacted by adding posters outside of the museum in Bern. Okay, okay, so basically, you know, he was kind of questioning why he should have been in the museum, why he was not selected, so he reacted by simply pasting his art around the museum. So we, we tried to restage that. So we took the literacy of the operation quite uh, seriously. And here are some pictures of the final reconstruction. This is Richard Serra, fragments of the old space, fragments of the existing Venetian Palazzo coming together as a theatrical representation. What we, of course, were not able to recreate was the spirit of the original exhibition. This was a corporate operation by a major fashion brand who basically gathered together all those artists, now the majority of them in their 80s, if they were still alive. This phone that you see here was actually the piece that Walter Maria put into the exhibition, a piece that he, it was a phone that he was keeping on calling, so there was the kind of this constant ringing, yeah? And eventually nobody was supposed to answer, and, and here you see the trick, basically, all the sort of, um, uh, controversiality of the operation. In this case, the collector, Miucha Prada, actually picked up the phone and declared the end of that moment. Um, Walter Maria died two months after. So uh, it's a kind of a very awkward coincidence. So we were highly, uh, although this was from an architectural perspective, a very interesting archaeological kind of work. There is nothing to do really with display per se, except that, of course, the architecture in itself becomes the display or the sort of consolidation between two architecture has become the display, but leaving basically behind what was actually the driving spirit of that generation of architects, of artists gathered by Harold Zeman in that space. So we could not recreate this, of course. Hmm. I, well, I, we can all understand the problematics be, be around this particular exhibition, I would say, yeah? both in terms of location and timing and in the way how you did it and, and, and the particular context. Um, would you like us to go to elaborate a little bit more on that? Or because uh, I don't think we have a lot of time, we, but... I elaborate on it. Okay. No, well, I, to be honest, I'm, I was completely. I, I saw this exhibition and I was I was enthralled by it. I, I thought it was the kind of action which I I, I missed in, in 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 you could say my own cultural practice. 
Uh, the fact that you you dare to restage as, as something which was considered to be, you could say, so opposite towards an institutional practice. Uh, and uh, so to me, it was an, an act of daring, and, and maybe the same type of daring, the same type of courage, which was necessary in order to make it in first 60, place. yeah, in the first place. Um, so this is, I think, what I like most of it. And then secondly, and this is, of course, also a question of budget and power, which is maybe linked to Prada Foundations and your quality, is the fact that you can do it in such a way. Yeah? The type of position, which is almost perverse, you know, I, I totally enjoy it. Yeah? Uh, and that is maybe to do with, uh, with something else, namely the fact that, you know, if, if you can elaborate on, on certain things on, as, as an aesthetic experience, uh, not so much as a conceptual experience. Wow, it was well done. Uh, and, and I wasn't at the opening where I think this particular moment was there that Mircea Prada picked up the phone. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these, these, these beautiful little anecdotes or you could say even me metaphors eh, are quite interesting. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think we, we, we have come up to a million other projects almost. Uh, uh, what we try to do is combine certain projects of both of us. Um, and... Uh, this project, which let's, let's simply use this particular moment in time, uh, at least I was asked to be the curator for the Dutch Pavilion in Venice. Uh, and in fact, uh, it, it, to, to me, it had a moment of the same type of urgency, you could say. Because at that moment, uh, the Dutch government had decided to, to kill the cultural infrastructure completely by quite draconic cutbacks. At the same time, there, there was a kind of populist rhetoric which was very much focused on the notion of identity. Uh, and especially national identity. So I thought maybe it's interesting to address the question, especially with a collective of artists, this notion of, of, of uh, national identity. Um, but as you can see, it's a, a completely different moment in time where, where you could say the restaging had a very fundamental role for, for, the, for, for, the, for the architect and the notion of architecture. The first one, of course, uh, tried to... To, to maybe project an idea of energy more than of staging. Yeah? Uh, although it was a collective practice and they had to share a certain space. Here, again, it, it is a collective, but all the works are, you could say, almost dissolve into an architectural model. Uh, but in fact, they are quite fundamental building blocks through which this, 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 this so-called architecture is created. So you could say the classic relationship between an artwork and, 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 uh, and architecture. Uh, which is, uh, and many times discussed in terms of, uh, of balance, yeah? and, and a kind of optimum is created through a notion of balance. In this case, oh, where we are. Uh, in this case, uh, the artworks really, in, in an almost overly concrete way, functioned as building blocks. Uh, one of the things maybe I, I mentioned to you is, is this, uh, in fact, they were all institutional walls, which were organized as, how do you call it, the... Uh, in a theater, you have all these, these sides where you can... Flats. Flats? Uh, in the wings, the wings, the wings of a theater? The wings? Okay. Okay, so they, they were constituted as, as wings, so flats, wings, whatever. Uh, and the, 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 the one which is... Because obviously the metaphor is simple. It's a theater, you know, it invites an audience, it, it has an empty stage. An empty stage as a result of cutbacks, but the uh, uh, the, the view on the end is a very particular. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to get there. I'm not sure if I'm able to get there. Uh, there, you see this 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 spot at the end. Um, that's. Uh, a very interesting moment when at the National Museum, the Nachtwacht, which is maybe the most emblematic painting in the Netherlands, and if one painting symbolizes notions of national identity, it's that particular uh, painting. It was taken away. Uh, but year after year, they tried to paint the wall around it. And when they took away the painting in order to restore it, suddenly this modernist <laughs> uh, gesture was revealed. And we made a picture of that and then presented it here uh, as the centerpiece of this uh, uh, collaborative work. Uh, you know, kind of reference to the notion of national identity and maybe the notion of absence. Um, so that, that's another form of reconstituting which we thought would be interesting in this, in this particular conversation. Where, if, of course, like the... The, the, the problematic aspect of the, when at the, the reenactment of when attitude becomes form is that it became immediately read as an extremely nostalgic uh, operation, um, r rather differently from this one, where of course the idea of co 
basically constructing a stage infrastructure um, allowed somehow, at least that's the way I see it, the uh, let's say construction of new meanings by the repositioning basically of national identity against a certain symbolic elements. Um, and I think basically that the main issue that uh, we faced in the first uh, project was, was this idea to basically um, try to be too literal without adding a, a degree of criticality to the very act of restaging and to the power that basically that very act of restaging was actually uh, symbolizing. Uh, yeah, this is another project. It's actually a completely different story. Um, of course, when you walk through the exhibition um, that you have here, um, display, the, the, the notion of display design is very central. Um, I'm basically, uh, I came across, of course, in my studies and in my direct experience, uh, I studied in Italy, uh, the, the work of Albini and Scarpa. I've met engineers who work with Scarpa and, and they were uh, still traumatized by the attitude of, uh, you know, a person that would actually walk in the wor working site and decide one by one what to do, basically. And I think one of the most interesting aspects is to actually listen to the stories of people who were really questioning the attitude of Scarpa, who was trying to act to design something more beautiful, more sophisticated than the actual object that he was trying to display. So there was a constantly this ambiguity of designing a display as a work of art, yeah? which was sometimes more important than the work of art itself. Um, so we, we, we came across also exercises of this kind, so how to redesign specific you know, uh, display features um, and how to basically turn an exhibition into, some, into something that can be um, re-engineered from the redesign of one single element. For the opening uh, of, again, Fondazione Prada, it's by chance that the first two projects are actually from the same client. We had, we had the luck to work with a very famous historian, a classic historian uh, from Italy, it's called Salvatore, Salvatore Settis, who's an expert of classic history. And together, we sort of conceptualized a history which was dealing with the idea of seriality in classic sculpture. Um, so the idea basically that certain um, statues were present in thousands of copies, they were sort of distributed across the empire, and so there was basically no traceable original. Salvatore Setti has made a huge amount of work by gathering all copies of uh, different kind of uh, statues, and we presented them uh, in the main space of Fondazione Prada when it opened in Milan in 2015. Now, what we did as a sort of design approach was a critical attack to the idea of the Sokol. You know, classic statues, this is uh, Christian de Porzan Park, we are in Athens. Normally, classic statues are always presented on a pedestal, which of course implies a certain relationship between the body of the visitor and the body of the statue, which is, by definition, you know, uh, creating a distance in a way. Uh, can I have the, sorry. Oh, yes, one. of course. And what we did by simply uh, operating on that notion, on that distance, was to undo the presence of the pedestal in uh, Fondazione Prada by creating a floor or a sort of topography that would embed all the socles of the statues. So that instead of walking through a field of pedestals, you would actually walk through uh, simplified topography. Yeah? And the result was quite stunning because basically by separate, by basically undoing this relationship or undoing the presence of the Sokol, you would be able to approach almost naturally the statues by walking through this topography. And of course there were limits yeah, due to insurance and security and so on, but it was actually possible to really walk through this horizon. Here you see again the idea of seriality that the exhibition was trying to represent and stage. It was not, it was, not easy and obviously quite a demanding operation also in terms of you know use of materials and and uh, and investment in in materials but at the end basically what we were surprised that people would actually really use this huge space as a navigation device 
mixing with the body of the sculptures. So that there was a sort of ambiguity at the end between audience and object in display. You would always and constantly see basically the idea of the, the, the idea of seriality that the exhibition was actually displaying against, of course, an audience that, that was sometimes in on display, sometimes basically experiencing the actual artworks. And we also went further by yeah, reinventing in a way the way you know um, elements were actually hanging as opposed to stand on a, a pedestal. Um, let me go quick. This, this is some pictures from the installment. It was quite touching in a way. And what happened basically is that the exhibition was supposed to stay for um, six months. And eventually, it was really highly used by uh, the audience to the point that a static display of bodies became uh, almost naturally a stage for, oops, sorry, for a dancing festival, which was occupying the same stage. Um, so from you know static bodies to moving bodies. And in a way, like this came simply by uh, the single observation of how to reinvent or how to redesign the idea of, of, of a circle, of, of basically a pedestal. Um, I was, when I was looking at the things, I thought, okay, I understand that you, you that you have this 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 almost uh, fundamentalistic idea to question the notion of the circle, mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, thanks to the, the architecture, uh, you you it, it it was made possible to make the whole floor into a circle. Uh, so did you, did you really question that particular thing, or did you did you simply found another device, another architectural device, in order to create the kind of? Uh, no, I, be, I mean the. Fundamentally, the idea is that because the exhibition actually opened the new building, that was the most natural, let's say, decision to actually use the building to embed, in a way, the objects on display. And there is obviously a certain, you know, criticality because, of course, like uh, heights were different, uh, uh, materials which we had to use were was not really difficult to so was extremely difficult to source and so on. But let's say what we I think the whole point was to basically, um, you know, uh, simply undo the distance between object in display and, and audience and play with that ambiguity in a way. That's something that you can also find, again, I was mentioning Scarpa before, but, um, you know, when, uh, or with Albini, today I was actually moved by the visit uh, when, you know, uh, Dirk took the Albini display of the moving painting, and then you wonder, okay, what am I looking at? Am I looking at a guy moving a painting or am I looking at the painting itself? Yeah. So there is a level of performativity in a way which I think came, of course, into the stage probably in those years. Uh, once things were made more democratic and things were made more democratic everywhere, not simply in, in museums and so on, which I think was also part of the reflections that we wanted to embed in the exhibition uh, format in this case. I remember there was this guy asking a, a quite a, pro a problematic question, namely the fact that you know would, would these type of tools, which were now re-established, would they be you know who was it? Sorry, um, would ah hello, <laughs> would would they become part of a kind of uh, you could say repertoire of, of possibilities? And 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 in fact, you quite explicitly also referred to the wall. Well, let's, let's say the white wall as a as, as something which is constantly being repeated as 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 a as a tool, uh, and, and these were maybe considered to be unique pieces and, and therefore, uh, um, well, you know, maybe used if they were one time reinstated but not, not part of a repertoire of possible uh, objects uh, or devices. Yeah. I, I, I was thinking when I looked at this, but I, I thought, ah, okay, so this is what's going to happen. You know, the architecture is going to be a kind of a living body, you know, capable of, of responding to every type of demand. And, and you know all these type of of rather unique or uh, or devices will become part of a of an architecture which is in a, in a constant responsive relationship to either an audience or an artifact and and, and I thought that that was one of the points you know which were was made here mm -hmm. huh? um. i mean i think I think it all it all has to do with basically introducing a degree of informality not yeah. interactiveness because that's no. uh, an abuse terms of course but 
a degree of informality to the experiencing of the of the art itself, which I think is really proper of the work of uh, Scarpa and, Al and Albini, but Albini especially, uh, but also eventually also of, of Lina Bobardi. But let's say the idea basically that you know there are multiple point of views, that you can change your point of views, that you can navigate around an object, that you can basically change your position towards the object, question how the object has been made by simply going on the back of it. And so, mm -hmm. so this, in a completely collateral way, was also starting from these considerations. OK, uh, another project. Uh, it was one of the uh, projects we, we did at the Institute. I didn't do myself, but uh, a fantastic man, Andreas Angelidakis, an artist, uh, did this. It was a reflection uh, on our part on, uh, on, on, on the period room. Uh, and this particular period com room comes from the Stalic Museum uh, and, 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 in fact, uh, was taken away when Sandberg introduced the white cube. And the poor thing had, had, been, had been slumbering somewhere in a cave for uh, about 30 years. And, and, and we said, is it still there? Yeah, yeah, I think it's still there. Well, let's have a look. And okay, okay, they found it. And, and we took it out and uh, it was publicly restored. And Andreas came up with a, a beautiful, you could say, not so much a theoretical response to this uh, particular moment in time that the period room was taken out of uh, the, the, the museum repertoire, uh, but came up with a much more psychological response. So for instance, this is a white cube trying to be a period room. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the poor thing, you know, it only has a bit of whiteness and a bit of calcium in order to, to become a period room. It lacks all the, the crafty qualities which uh, uh, period rooms normally have. And uh, so there was a, he had created a whole uh, a, a series of, of possible uh, reflections on the white cube and, and you could say uh, m maybe more anachronistic uh, sentiments, which of course are also a fundamental part of, of staging and, 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 and uh, the art show. In this case, the longing to become once more a period room and, 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 and close the moment that we needed the white cube as the ultimate neutral space. I can ask you something. What was the ultimate agency of such a project? Um, to display a moment that was lost, to actually create a new archive, in which way basically the exhibition sort of uh, transcend its mere representation to actually become something else, or to be useful to something else? Yeah. Well, the thing is, is, is that uh, exhibition making, and it's also within the field of, of architecture, it, it's filled with cliches. Yeah? So, for instance, if you talk about architectural exhibition, completely different than the art exhibitions, you always have to talk about the absence, the absence of the object. Well, of course, nowadays we become all on display. <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, so what I think the, uh, the Institute tried to do is, is say, okay, we need to set up a new vocabulary uh, for instance, for exhibition making. Um, but, but let's reflect uh, upon the tools which were given to us. And, and therefore, we had to go to, for instance, these type of uh, instruments which were, which were once formulated. So the agency was uh, to, 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 to set up a kind of conversation with the field of architecture and design about the possible tools which we had in order to, to visualize or, 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 or transform certain questions into the domain of visibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, we could only, the, this was for us a very a clear example, eh? namely that, that staging has a kind of history and secondly, has a possible future. Mm -hmm. uh. But there was no basically idea to, in a way, use this exhibition and the work of these artists to actually rescue some of this material. Or to bring it back to life. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, the, the moment we set up this conversation, it suddenly became uh, important for the Amsterdam Museum, who is now currently owning all these uh, all these rooms, to restage them. And secondly, they in fact just started a whole uh, series of exhibitions about uh, restaging their collection. So, funny enough, although to us. It was, uh, you could say, a, a, a moment of criticality. Yeah? Uh, what is an exhibition? How can we manifest it? It became that? a model for them. It became yeah. a model for them. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. So you, you acted basically as a sort of laboratory for the Amsterdam Museum. It seems yeah. to be the case that we were like a, a bit of a catalyst. Also for ourselves, to be honest. Uh, but don't forget that this particular institute, especially in the 90s, used the exhibition as a promotional tool. And, and we wanted to transform it to, into a tool of criticality. And so we also had to go through this history almost to, to, to find that particular moment. That's very interesting. 
Um, we decided to include also some very commercial work, uh, and it was mentioned before um, that the Albinis and the Scarpas actually work also in the domain of commerce. And uh, I was just mentioning to Goose that among the sort of collection of projects that we worked on, there was also this, um, let's say, yeah, history experiment or historical experiment about the history of uh, the biggest department store or the most iconic department store in, uh, in Italy called La Rinascente. Um, and the Rinascente was a very interesting, let's say, <coughs> institution for a moment in time because between the 1950s and the 1980s basically became a training ground for many of those architects who became huge the years after. So they hired Albini when he was very young. They hired... Um, Gio Ponti, when he was 22, they hired Italo Lupi, a very famous graphic designer, when he was 19. So they all trained for years into the display of commerce, actually. And they became then architects, and they, they basically worked in that domain because there was a lot of freedom. Of course, things were going really fast, and department stores, we were just discussing with Goose this morning, they became a window into what other European countries were doing by staging, for example, temporary exhibitions about products coming from Germany or from the UK. So they sort of acted as a vehicle for the construction of a European modern identity. So it was interesting to work on this exhibition because although very commercially, that it basically was also starting from you know, a, a, an archive which was digitalized and so on, but there were also some artifacts that we had to find around in different kind of foundations and so on because it became a sort of exhibitions of exhibitions, because uh, it, it, it was not just about displaying art, it was about displaying photography, uh, fashion campaigns, graphic materials, poster makings, products, of course, and a number of artists who actually worked with Rinascente through these 100 years. So it was a way to tell the history of a place through their non-commercial operations, and in a way, it became also the history, um, a sort of other or alternative history of um, Italian economy, you might say. So for example, this room, which was dedicated to a very famous poster designer who also operated internationally called Dudovic, was treated almost as an archival room or archival display, which was um, basically, uh, the, and we allowed people to actually play with this. Um, obviously, it's the whole exhibition. It's a bit over the tones because it was the exhibition, of course, of a department store and not of a museum. Um, this was a room dedicated to graphic collaborations. This was a room dedicated instead to artistic collaborations, and especially this department store had a huge history of, uh, let's say, uh, synergies with artists such as Richard Hamilton or Piero Manzoni, people who really worked on the notions of mass production and how basically mass production changed our way of life. So we sort of turned this room into a sort of a ideal supermarket or archive, something in between, an ambiguous uh, definition. Photography was displayed a la Lina Bobardi in a way, in the sense that we thought basically to elevate the role of photography to the role of paintings. So there was always this kind of ambiguity proper of uh, these kind of places to use you know, models which were sort of extracted from other domains, maybe more cultural, at the service of commercial display, which was something that was happening in those years, but the other way around. But and interestingly enough, you say that it's the surface of, of, of a kind of a commercial display, but to me it's also, you could say, the, the, the exhibition becomes a, a research instrument in order to approach something which is, 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 has become fundamentally ambiguous, namely the, the domain of design, yeah. uh, which maybe operates in, 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 in territories like biannuals and festivals and, 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 and is, is not part of a, an official or of a canonized notion of, of history. So to me, uh, although we, we can come up with a kind of classic definition between culture and commerce, uh, you know, to me this is a, almost an academic tool um, in order to, to, to make something visible which would otherwise stay uh, fundamentally uh, obscure. No? I mean, basically the exhibition was also a way in this case to build an archive of something that doesn't really have an archive. Because of course these places, although they had extremely rich histories of collaborations across multiple domains of visual cultures, of course they are not museums. So the 
exhibition became a vehicle to actually build that kind of knowledge or that kind of historical knowledge, besides being, of course, a research in two exhibition formats. Um, I mean, some of it was, of course, dedicated to fashion or the history of fashion. This was basically part of a loan that we got from the MoMA from a unique series <coughs> by Missoni, uh, changing rooms, familiar models which we recreated inside the, um, um, the place where the exhibition was actually staged, Palazzo Reale in Milan. We wanted to also recreate spaces which were very familiar to an audience that sort of inhabits commonly the space, the sort of everyday life of citizens in Milan became basically a way to actually display the history of fashion of the Renascente. Do you think that this type of histories are, are we ever capable of to, to write them again? Because these are like multi-brand stores. Eh? These are the moment that it was still possible that there was one interface through which... I mean, the, 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 this is a great question because of course, like in the same way that these places became platform for the training of people such as Japonti and Albini and so on, mm. they, because they also were training ground for designers who actually became famous eventually yeah. and they created their own brands. So again, Armani, when he was young, was working for Rinascente, was mm. designing for Rinascente before the brands were even created. So the idea was basically, in a way, in a way to sort of stage industry from a sort of cultural perspective, but more as an engine. At a very particular moment of time, and it was of course, possible the 50s to, and yeah. 60s. It yeah. was possible only then. Yeah. Then, with, of course, with the emergence of the neoliberal economy and, you know, like everything changed also in the definition of how these places were actually orchestrated and run. Yeah, because you know, the history of commercial spaces is not something which is uh, easily touched upon. Absolutely. Uh, but but the, the, the fact that, for instance, you referred to uh, Cobra and, and I think the Bayekorov, uh, and, and in this case, uh, Rinocenti and the, the particular role of, uh, of, of that instrument in order to, to, to project an idea of innovation or of lifestyle, of, of, of currency, or, or the, the here and now, you know, that, that role is completely over. Uh, that it's now taken over by you could say mono brands yeah. um, with a very particular view which is not uh, you, you, which you cannot generalize anymore it's uh, it's organized around it's a very particular identity which needs to be repeated in and again talking about connections uh, this place became basically the initiator of a very famous international prize called the golden compass in product design so here you basically have a collection of working tables of many of the products which were awarded the famous golden compass and here you see a lot of actually products from Albini within yeah. the same room. So there is a constant dialogue between, also in terms of technique. Today, for example, you know, when you look at the way displays were actually designed in your exhibition, there is a high or so a highly sophisticated understanding of technique um, which was coming from this industry, which was coming from their experiences with actual product and design product making. So this kind of dialogue, a question that I didn't ask to the curators actually was why there was not, um, for example, um, in the exhibition a connection to you know the cultural context these people actually grew up into. You know, Milan and all northern Italy were all about development of specific industrial models, which then in turn mm. came back into the cultural sphere. A lot of those designs would not be possible unless there were a strong support of, you know, coming from an in, an, a dialogue with the industry, with the, not necessarily commercial displays, but really with the industry behind it. So it would have been very beautiful for me finding the connection between those engines, in a way, and the engines that the same authors were actually applying into other forms of design and, and display. Do you think it's a, you refer to agency, uh, from we, sorry? Mike, okay. Uh, <laughs> you, we, we refer to agency. Do you think that, you know, when we talk about cultural, cultural institutes and, and the possibility of this particular cultural rearm, that, that these type of histories, uh, which are fundamentally lacking, I would say, and, and suddenly could be organized around the idea of, of, of a department store and, in, and its personalized history, mm -hmm. uh, um, do you think that, that this type of, of, of knowledge production uh, should become part of, 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 of an, an institutional practice. I mean, I, I think, I mean, you said it before, uh, there has been a tendency, now I think it's, it's definitely over in a way, to separate 
the domains between you know what is what whatever is it's commercial. It's not about disciplines. It's much, to me, it's much more about formal versus informal. You could say that, mm. that the forms of, of knowledge production, which which stays opaque in a way, because they are not institutionalized, and and in a they're way they're not you, on stage. Yeah, they're not yeah. on stage. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, like I for me, you know, I come from a very specific context. Mm. Uh, okay, I've been living, as you know, for a long time abroad and and working in the Netherlands, you know, in Europe and so on. But I came from a context where this exchange which is the Milanese, it's completely natural. Mm. There is no way to understand people of the calibers of Scarpa and Albini when With you extract that, them yeah. from that experience. So whenever you do exhibitions about um, them, normally you always have the multiplicity of their production in order to basically understand their work as an holistic practice. But still, even today, we, when we talk about Scarpa, we, we cut them off from that particular practice. Oh, but before you mentioned, they mentioned, of course, like, you know, no, the... No, no, the no, criticism no, was no. there. It's, a, it's, more, it's much more, you could say, a multidisciplinary practice, which is, is, is yeah, you could say authorized in a way. Okay, yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> Penelope is focusing that I should Used to my, my oh, okay, uh, sorry, yeah. I always think that my voice has enough volume to. No, it doesn't. She says, okay. <laughs> She's being very strict to me. Okay, sorry. But to answer your questions, I think as as let's say from an institutional perspective, uh, because we discuss also the future of institutions this morning and so on, uh, this connection, so the interception between these different domains, it's where you can actually create really new value. And by also enlarging basically the audience spectrum that you want to appeal to. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, this, is, this is something you also referred to this morning that you know exhibitions lack maybe the type of lightness which it maybe could have. I mean, it ha maybe had a kind of societal urgency, but at the moment that you know we always talk about blockbusters and so on and so on. So you could say, for instance, that the immersive or the visual experience need to be so almost over intensified in order to attract a possible audience. Also, in relationship to the cap the, the, the competition of a, of a commercial area where display is, of course, uh, very well organized and predominant. Um, our exhibitions here, of course, this is a very rich, visually rich, ex and you go from one atmosphere to the other, and they're, they're, it's very much focused around that every space has, has an intensified experience, and a different one as the one before that, which, of course, when we looked at, at the, for instance, the, the the exhibition of Smithsons, it's a very fluid uh, continuity uh, in which the notion of light and whiteness uh, dominates. Do you think that these type of exhibitions are also of the past, in a way? Of the Smithsons, like? Yeah? Uh, it's because the, <laughs> the question of contemporary was asked. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's difficult to say, but let's say my practice also spends uh, in, in the design of museum, actual cultural mm. spaces, and some of the harshest conversations that we have are actually with curators who normally ask for very natural spaces. So the idea of a natural environment to support the display of work of art is still really, really present. But some of the most interesting, let's say, surprises that we had is when we were actually able to change the frame of mind and introduce spaces which have a very, very strong character as a way to basically let artists or the art react to it. Mm. Uh, we are not presenting it today, but um, I don't think it's a... It, I don't think it's basically the two are exclusive of each other, but I think the encounter of a very specific conditions with uh, work of art challenges artists which are really sensitive and really, really good in actually dealing with that kind of, uh, with, with let's say, with highly designed environments in a very interesting way. Um, the discussion that we had around, for example, the garage in mm. Moscow or even Fondazione Prada in Milan were really about that, you know, how neutral spaces sh should have been you know, how flexible in the sense of not producing any frictions spaces should have been. And actually, when you look also, even at the exhibition today, with the exception of the exhibition of the Smithsons, everything that we see today has a very strong presence. Mm -hmm. Either the display, either the backdrop of the Aldo Van Eyck um, work. Um, I mean, in a way, there is a completely dynamic dialogue between the work of art and the environment or the display, which is basically challenging the work of art and challenging, of course, the user in that kind of relationship. I think that that's maybe something that we'll tend to see more and more. In a way, like cultural spaces are liberating themselves from the need to be completely neutral in order to engage the audience and the work of art itself in a more dynamic way. Mm. Well, it's very interesting that you 
refer back to it because, for instance, you, you were also referring to this notion of comfort. Uh, sorry, Penelope, I'm, I'm very, I'm hor I never learn. You know, I, I, I'm fundamentally a dilettante. Okay, I'll hold on to this. Uh, uh, but you were also referring to this question of, of, of almost of comfort, you know, trying to give your audience a possible comfort in order to, to make them relax in a way and, and, and deal with, with the propositions which are offered to them. Uh, but of course, in the field of, of retail, this notion of comfort is taken to the extreme where everything becomes a kind of smoothless, conflictuous kind of uh, conflictless experience. Uh, what you also introduced here is next to comfort, of course, a notion of estrangement. Uh, the fact that they, they, these are uh, historical models which are reinstated also creates a kind of inconsistency. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that this is the, the fundamental core of exhibition making, but it's, it's somewhere between you know, this, 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 this generous gesture of giving comfort and, and, and this moment of, 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 of conflict, which is as necessary to introduce, a, uh, uh, well, may, may, maybe a conversation. Um, do you agree on that? And, and do you also agree that maybe the notion of, 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 of display um, neutralizes this question a little bit and, and, and emphasizes the idea of comfort a bit too much. To me, the, the, the question of art, the title art and display is a little bit provocative almost, uh, especially because I understood in Portuguese it's, 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 uh, it's, it's models which are presented or so. It's impossible to translate it. Ah, that's it. Yeah. Display, it's, we, we found it impossible to find an adequate translation. So the subtitle is not quite the same. It's uh, forms of sh exhibiting. Yeah. I, I understood it was a question of language and made it fundamentally difficult to, mm. to come up with a direct uh, translation. But uh, you could say that, that art on display has, has a kind of a, a problematic quality, uh, which is maybe part of the, the conversation you want to start. Could say more about what you mean by that, but I'm not going to be part of this uh, conversation. I, I could say that, you know, uh, uh, design could be on display, fashion could be on display, but art could never be on display, you know. Uh, art either has a kind of intrinsic quality, which is probably celebrated by these particular architects, or it has a contextual quality. But it, 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 cannot, be, it cannot simply exist purely by the gesture of display, I would say. But I would okay, we ignore it. I, I would, I would at least, I would disagree with this. Yeah, of course. No, <laughs> <laughs> no but, but no, simply because I think, I think the role of display, or at least the role of displays that we've seen in the exhibition, maybe hopefully in, uh, in some of the work that we have shown today, it, it's about maximizing that value. It's about basically reflecting mm -hmm. on the values of the work of art itself by maybe changing the perspective. But I think you're, what you're doing it. is not displaying; you're staging. And that's why I was so fascinated by the notion of staging, because to me, you create possible environments through which you know something is maybe invited to reveal itself, or in a specific way, or you are invited to relate. But uh, I think in, when, when you talk about staging, per se, the artifacts is not central any longer. Yes. It's central as much as its context is actually yeah. central. So, like, especially in the exhibition that you've shown about the um, Venice Biennial Pavilion, maybe... Uh, some of the work that I've also, I've also shown. I mean, the point is that if you create a context around the uh, artifacts per se, and the context can be a scenography or something else, then obviously there is a relationship that is not any longer centralized on the value of the artifact itself, yes. but rather the relationship that the artifact is able to actually create with its own scene. Mm -hmm. So it's very different from what we have seen, uh, what we see in the exhibition today. It's maybe something that came up in the maybe uh, design of exhibitions later on, influenced by other kind of uh, different and visual fields. But I, I think it's more about, let's say, recontextualizing what you're, what you're actually seeing in a larger set of, in a larger conversation, basically. And then it becomes your work as a scenographer, not as an exhibition designer, mm -hmm. so it's two different things, to actually give stage to that conversation. Mm -hmm. But it's not really, I wouldn't call it exhibition design any longer. It's, yeah. As you say, it's stage design. Yeah, and we were even we, we were even wondering if if, if 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 this current practice of exhibition had to be addressed in terms of a kind of emancipation of the exhibition, you know, almost uh, devoid from uh, from the artifact, or if it was a or if it or it was a, a 
tragic, a tragic moment in time. You know that 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 the, the, the notion of contextualization had become so fundamental that you could that you could almost withdraw from the idea of either a product, an object, an artifact, or. So w w w I, I think, think we're both a little bit no, I mean, wondering it, it, it's where an we are. It's an open question, but well. let's say the generation that is shown in the exhibition today, it's a generation that was at the center of the stage. Yes. You know, it was able to actually operate autonomously uh, with a lot of, let's say, um, agency in their projects. Um, I was, I was, I'm always fascinated to discuss these exhibitions in relationship to the conditions that we face today as designers. You know, we would not be able to design something like no, this because the conditions impossible. are not there, no. the, the insurance protocols are different. Um, let's say they would never, you, you would never get loans for, let's say, pieces which are displayed in the way that these pieces are displayed. Oh. So uh, there is a sense of, I mean, as a designer, I have a sense of powerlessness, you know, oh. towards my practice. So I have to basically escape somewhere else to actually generate my own impact and value within this kind of domain. Because in itself, you know, the restrictions are so, so uh, heavy that you are not any longer basically the person directing the scene. You're just a piece of a larger machine and you can only facilitate that machine from happening. So that's why I don't really believe in the autonomy of our practice because it's something that it's becoming a bigger, bigger challenge. Uh, so I understand that, of course, what was, there, what was done in the exhibition in this specific case, at the Gould Belkin Foundation, it's possible because, of course, you could mobilize your own collection. It would probably be not possible if you would have to actually, you know, pick pieces around, and who knows whether those pieces can actually be displayed with the same level of informality and beauty and openness that we have experienced today. So, let's say, it's great to see these models, but today they are almost impossible to replicate because the practice has changed so much and the conditions around the practice have changed so much. So we escape towards other forms of representation and staging. If we would ever replicate an exhibition you made, you know, what would, it, would it be the, you could say the dominant storyline around that? In, in this particular, well, I don't know, maybe the 24-hour museum. Huh? Let's... Uh, uh, um, because in this case, you know, you could still refer to a very particular moment in time, post-war, the post-war trauma, the, the, the longing to, to, to reintroduce a notion of a possible future, which is, uh, you know, which maybe was not possible in the outside, but maybe within the, 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 the safety of a, a cultural institute could be, could be projected. Um, and, 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 and it's very much a story about figures, about uh, characters with uh, prestige and status. And momentum, uh, so th this this story could be told in in, in, in as, as as if the world is co uh, organized around characters. Uh, if we would ever, yes, well, yeah, yeah. if we would ever tell your story, you know, what would the story be? Would it be evidently it's not a story of one particular character? But how how would you? Would it be a story of a narrative which we would replicate? What would be? What would, could be a possible I mean, the, historical the, the, line? The, the only possible story is a story of multiple dialogues mm. where I'm never, let's say, as a practitioner, really in the center. You know, I'm simply the person sort of uh, curating the dialogue, but for the rest, uh, you know, the inputs coming towards within a project are, let's say, fundamentally very difficult uh, in a way to, to master in the way these people used to master them. But you in know, a way, this is it's almost. Like you remember, we were yeah. talking about Scarpa, you know, and the mm. way he was going to the working site. I mean, the guy was going to the working site with a black hat and with a long black <laughs> uh, what cape. Was cape. You know, like he was kind of a sort of a warrior, you know, coming there and then, you know, like talking very harshly to every single worker on the site. He had an authority that we simply, I mean, it's very difficult to have nowadays. And of course, it was very. Peculiar, he made it legendary, but it's something that is uh, almost impossible to replicate. That mm. generation was specific to a moment, as you said, in, in time of the 20th century, and it came with the benefit and maybe with uh, other kind of problematics, but that moment is really difficult So to replicate. So for me, the issue is the only thing that I can tell are basically, uh, the only thing that I can say about the practice that we sort of conduct is that it's a series of dialogues. And it's not a dialogue between 
me as a designer and an artist. It's a dialogue between me and an artist and a contractor and the insurance company and let's say, uh, let's say the forces that a corporation basically inject mm -hmm. into what you want to do, you know, which are tremendously big um, and multiple other forces. So, like I said, we are just one point of a larger network of relationships and we can only discuss the narratives of that rela those relationships. And do you think that those type of narratives are, maybe we have to, but yeah. are they the same within a cultural field and for instance the commercial field? Are they completely synonymous nowadays? I, I, uh, I, I think it's, there is, uh, there are, there is maybe uh, in some cases you could say that institutions or cultural institutions such as this one or yours are safe havens for a specific way of operating. Um, of course they, they have all sorts of pressures and so on. Um, but in principle, for example, the, conjection, the connection between you know, uh, corporations and cultural productions is so strong that in a way the logic of one domain transfers very easily to the, the other, other domain yeah. and vice versa. And an artist is a victim. Art is a victim of that, mm. obviously. I mean, you have to think about galleries, for example. I mean. But if you, we started with this very particular moment in time, 68, when institutes were, you could say, questions fundamentally. And, and I think the first exhibition you showed is also the result of that particular moment of time. Um, how, how would you read this particular space uh, in relationship to an outside world nowadays? Is it still something which we have to w throw a bomb in, or is it something which you know, has, has found a new raison d'etre, uh, maybe also uh, in relationship to the dominance of a, of a certain neoliberal market? Well, I mean, I don't direct a foundation, uh, a, a cultural institution, so maybe that's more a question for, for Penelope. Um, but I, I, for me, it's difficult. I'm an operator, basically, mm. so I, I, for me, it's difficult to give an answer. But, um, I, I I can only basically report of my own uh, experience and of, let's say of of, of this, this basically lack of constant lack of real agency mm. in our in our design practice. Let's keep it to that. Do you yeah. want to do you want to see one other, another exhibition or not? Or more other? <laughs> you want to get us out of that room as quickly yeah. as possible? Okay, good. We show you more. Okay. You want to show this? Yeah, show this. Okay. Um, well, talking about basically how desperate sometimes institutions are to actually generate attraction, uh, again, and in line with the idea to basically um, introduce, uh, you know, different models. Um, I was invited by an artist uh, called Francesco Vezzoli to conceptualize a sort of museum of, let's say, a 24 hours museum, so a temporary museum in Paris at the Palais de Jena, which is normally a branch of the French government. It's the Conseil Économique, Social et Environnemental. And uh, Vezzoli started from a very <coughs> clear statement, um, and which I thought was interesting, basically the idea that the museum had turned into social stages. So from you know, a platform for the communication of content into the pla into platform for the connection between people, yeah? Um, and of course there was a reflection, a wider reflection on uh, the current status of the art world and what, what does it stand for and what are the politics of it and so on. So the idea basically is that in order to create a sort of temporary version of a museum, we sampled out a number of museum, uh, you might say models from the storage to uh, to the white cube and so forth. And we sort of gave our own interpretation to host what he called his own art. This grotesque, strange combination between classic statues and feminine icons. And I mean, you have to understand, of course, that um, as part of the work that we do, we deal a lot with the contemporary artists, which of course have sometimes a completely ironic take on the project that they actually are developing with us. Um, so the beautiful space or the chambers of the ground floor of this uh, Palais de Jena, which was designed originally by a very famous French architect, Auguste Perret, uh, were turned into stations of this imaginary museum for only 24 hours. So the assembly was turned into a cinema and the white cube actually turned into a pink cube, which became the stage of a number of social rituals. The same social rituals that sometimes you find displayed into museums, a dinners, a white night, and eventually an exhibition space. So 
it turned into through the 24 hours, it basically hosted everything that an institution is actually doing today to promote itself, to communicate its values, but also to find supports where some audience was not allowed in, some audience was allowed in, so there was a constant sort of, sort of social tension that was orchestrated. And then eventually, you know, at night, this kind of place became a sort of a disco, so sort of the sacralization of a cultural space was put into discussion. Things happened through the night. And because we did not unveil, this was a sort of a grotesque operation and a reflection of the contemporary status of some institutions. Real art students came to visit this space from several schools in Paris, and they were sort of guided through the space by Vezzoli. And I'm not showing this as a kind of museum typology, of course, neither as a display typology, but just as a reflection of, let's say, models or different models of institutions of how on, on, on especially what institutions are sometimes forced to do. Higher truth. Ah. Okay. And rituals. Yeah, rituals, yeah. Um, uh, well, uh, in fact, it is, I think, the first exhibition I made once with uh, my partner, Herman Verkerk. And uh, I selected this because, uh, you know, we were constantly uh, going back and forth from the idea of, 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 of a certain architecture and a certain artifact and its possible relationship. And you could say that this, uh, this is uh, an exhibition of 25 years ago, uh, but the whole point was that there was nothing on show. Uh, nothing was there, and, uh, and uh, what happened is that, uh, of course, the, 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 the notion of ritual uh, and the notion of performance became uh, quite uh, fundamental. Uh, and so in this case, what you see here is the members of staff of, of, the, of the shop uh, trying to engage with you under the classic sentences, can I help you? Can I help you? Can I, can I help you? And of course, this created an enormous kind of psychological insecurity uh, because normally what you do if somebody comes up to you and, and, and says, can I help you? You dive into the clothes and say, no, 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 it's not necessary. Uh, uh, so th this was no, no longer possible. And, and what, what, uh, what the exhibition in the end was, was a highly, uh, you could say, uh, controlled idea of how uh, retail, in this case uh, fashion, uh, organized uh, the, its relationship to a possible audience. Uh, and, and we thought that this is, uh, every time uh, you know, an, an, a fashion show is, 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 is on show, it's always about a dress. You know, and preferably a big dress, and maybe a dress of a queen or whatever. But it's always about a dress, uh, and the whole point, of course, uh, in this case uh, of, of the world of fashion, is that it is capable of introducing certain rituals which uh, are extremely influential and 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 hardly discussed. Yeah? Uh, I'm not sure. Is this is this a kind of emancipation of architecture in a way, uh, through uh, in, in which the artifact uh, is no I, longer necessary? I think it's not any. Maybe it's not an emancipation of the architecture, but it's it's maybe an emancipation of an exhibition space mm. into something else, where exhibition is actually replaced by a living act, a performance. And I, I find that that is the tension that I find interesting because, of course, there is a form of architecture that is, in this, that is on display, which is your own installation that is accommodating all yes. these kind of uh, staged rituals to happen. In that sense, this is very similar to what we've seen before. Mm. I, I think we're living in a world which has become fundamentally invisible. And exhibitions have more and more the task to deal with this invisibility. And I think they have to go away from what is already visible anyway. So this is, this is maybe a first attempt to, to deal with this fundamental invisibility. But the exhibition becomes something else, therefore. Is that it? Have we done it? No. No? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Ah, I okay. mean, we, we can go on, but uh, we, you can also stop. This is an interesting questions. exhibition. Yeah. I, I would say, say yes. I think yeah. you should see this one. Okay, um, so maybe uh, there are certain things which are kind of introducing some of these micro chapters, and this is maybe the exhibition as a public space per se. Um, I have had the chance to basically curate uh, and design a bit or a fraction of a, the Biennial of Architecture in 2014, which took place in the Corderie of the Arsenale, so this very long, 330 meters long space. 
And the idea was to basically react to this very iconic exhibition uh, curated by Paolo Portoghese in 1980, the Strada Novissima, where a generation of architects, young at the time, including OMA, were actually invited to <coughs> display a new language. In that sense, it was actually the breakthrough of uh, uh, postmodernism. Mm -hmm. um, we did basically an exhibition that was, for the first time, uh, dealing with the uh, connection between four biennials, architecture, cinema, music, and theater and dance, so five, sorry. And the focus was basically a representation of the current status of Italy as a way to actually understand the status of Europe at the time. So to tell the story of an entire continent from a geopolitical perspective, but through the lens of one of its most critical countries. And I mean, I will not uh, deep dive into the contents, but basically the exhibition was orchestrated truly as a new form of public space. So in order to actually have a living environment, we let the other biennials colonize the architectural uh, exhibition. We did it through an intensive design of this space, which was uh, basically punctuated by a number of uh, movies which were reacting in a way to the architectural stories. So the exhibition was organized on one side with architectural case studies and on the other side with uh, cinematographic case studies which were echoing basically the um, architectural case studies. The whole thing here you see basically one half was dedicated to cinema. The whole thing was uh, kept together by one single scenographic and narrative device which was this large print of the um, Tabula Peutingeriana. It's basically the representation of the Roman Empire it was a very long, long, long map, still existing in two copies, which, funnily enough, was fitting the length of the Arsenale. So this became a sort of a both spatial and narrative device, which was orchestrating the relationship between architecture and cinema on the two sides, that you would flow in from one side to the other, so that the two sides would actually echo each other constantly. And then in between, what we call public spaces or public stages, where that they were used basically as special devices to actually look at the exhibition at the space from different point of views or to host performing arts. And this happened simultaneously at the architectural biennial. So they, once you would actually enter into the space, you would encounter a theatrical performance, a dance rehearsal, a workshop, while actually navigating through the architectural station. So, here, what we tried to question was not simply the way a biennial could actually be organized, but the very format of an um, exhibition space, or the very nature of an exhibition space. On this side, basically, this was the dance festival reacting to a project called Radical Pedagogies from Colombia, and so forth. But basically, the idea somehow was to try to intercept all the audiences of the biennial and give a space for all the audiences of the Banyol, which will basically coexist in a form of dialogue. We, of course, orchestrated the space. We tried to curate it as much as possible. But like I said, the main narrative here can only be explained through a constant dialogue. Nothing of this was ever finished. It was a constantly, let's say, evolving kind of experience so that if you could enter in the space in June, you would find a certain kind of environment. And if you would enter it in August, you would find an environment which was transformed by all the events which were actually happening there. This is obviously possible because we are operating in the context of a biennial, which is a much more fluid uh, environment than an actual um, cultural institution, such as uh, a museum. Maybe this also has to do a little bit with production, in a way, or the questioning of what an exhibition space can be. Um. Well, hey, thank you very much. I, what, what I really liked also when I was a visitor of that Bayani was the was the idea of 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 of, of um, uh, being uh, this things which are happening at the same moment eh? uh, and no longer after each other, but at the same moment. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, a, a, as you know, this, the, the, one of the ideas with the new institute is to become an, a new institute by being a new institute each time. So sometimes we we have been as 
an archive, we have been a, 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 a fashion museum, we have been, well, all, all kinds of particular positions uh, we have taken in which the, the whole institute transformed and also demanded another way of working from us. And here we became a fashion museum. Interestingly enough, in the Netherlands, uh, when we talk fashion, everybody always says, oh, well, there is no fashion, you have to go to Italy, you have to go to you. Uh, but of course, there's a beautiful story to be told, which is a story about uh, people who wear fashion. And, uh, you know, so it's not so much a story of, of the designer, it's a, it's a story of the user. Well, anyway, what we did here in terms of uh, simultaneousness is, is, is the fact that um, we turned, you could say, all the classic commercial spaces of the museum, which are the shop and the, uh, the, the bookstore and then the entrance and the coffee place into public spaces. And we made uh, the, all, the, all the exhibition spaces uh, commercial spaces. Uh, which was a bit naughty from us. Uh, and, and uh, for instance, uh, and, and, and we did it by, by a very particular idea of the archive in fashion, which I think is the, the, the vintage tour. The, the vintage tour is maybe the ultimate uh, the dynamic idea of, of an archive in fashion, contrary to, for instance, the museum. Uh, and, and it's also an archive which is uh, reinvented every year. Yeah, because uh, 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 fashion doesn't only reconstitute a possible future, it also reconstitute a possible past. Uh, so, like, believe me, the 80s in terms of fashion are completely different than the 80s. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, in this case, uh, you see here a, a wonderful archive. Everything was for sale, which also creates a completely different mode of, of interaction. People want to buy things. They don't want only to look at things. And when they want to buy things, they put them on and they put themselves on display and they start a conversation, how do I look, and so on and so on. This was to us very fundamental. But secondly, what we did is, which is I think is also something which maybe at least I really like as an institute to do is, is the fact that you can come up with uh, possible storylines, not the real story. Who cares about a real story? I would say that speculative histories are quite interesting. Uh, so what we had done is around this, you could say, commercial environment, we had created a possible history of, of uh, uh, Dutch fashion in which the... Uh, uh, the user had a very fundamental role. So, for instance, the importance of squatting, uh, the introduction of the notion of street style and the collage in the 60s, uh, self-making in the 50s when, you know, we created this anonymous architecture, but, you know, uh, you could say especially the wife in the family had the, 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 the task to create a notion of style through the interior and the way people were dressed, in most cases, self-made. All the other exhibitions, uh, this is another floor, where it also turns into... Um, as stores. In this case, uh, uh, designers uh, reinterpreted uh, designs from other people. Uh, I, I don't know if you know, but in, in fashion, about 40% of the clothes are never in the stores. There's a, the fundamental idea of overproduction. And they buy up all these clothes and then reinvented them, and people could you know, uh, reinterpreted them, and they, you know, they could be on sale. And the last, while well, you could say the first floor were much more about seduction, you know, sh showed a very grim storyline, uh, namely uh, the pollution, which is uh, fundamentally related to this 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 ridiculous industry, but which has become so uh, fundamentally part of our uh, uh, social system. Um, I, I, what I really liked about this particular project, although uh, it, 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 it's very much here presented as a, as a, as a kind of formal uh, design exercise, was the the the, the notion of of, of uh, simultaneous. Uh, presence, which uh, I think is also very fundamental in your uh, biannual. Uh, and it also gave us the possibility suddenly to be open on Thursday nights because that's when the shopping uh, streets are also open in the Netherlands. So suddenly it made us also, you know, to, to, to deal with a whole other, another idea of time. And context. And context, yeah. Go, stop. Okay, well, what I would really, well, I think we touched upon a certain notions about what an exhibition could be more than what an exhibition is, and I'm really grateful that you, you know, you, you were willing to Questions? be seduced into that conversation, and I'm very uh, grateful that you were willing to listen to our ramblings. Um, um, Should run, please. It's not. What are you gonna do? It's not because it's not interesting, and there are lots of questions. I, I myself have a number, but our poor uh, technicians have to go home. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so, thank you very much. That was great, and I think. <laughs> and I 
think that the best thing we can do is to suggest that anyone who would like to join us at the reception that's hosted by the new institute with more questions can stay with us and uh, ask questions, and we're very happy for that. I would like to thank you all. You too. Thank you, Fauter. Thank you, Dirk. I'd like to thank Diana Pereira, who uh, went out of her way to set this up. And this is more than your job is, I know. So thank you for all the work you've put into it. Francine, I don't know whether you'd like to say a few words, but essentially, anyone is very welcome to join us for a drink upstairs. Please do. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to us. <laughs> no, 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 come on, we understood that we were taking much too much time. But we were enjoying ourselves. <laughs>